three, two, one, and go. Hello and welcome to the final review for the um, pandemic um, studio, uh, uh, um, master thesis studio um, that has been taught by uh, Marina Rodriguez uh, Das Neves and myself. Um, I would like to say a few words about um, the studio, just a few words before introducing some of our, um, our reviewers. Um, this has probably been an academic year like no other. <laughs> That's probably an understatement in many ways um, uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, uh, it's been a student like no other in the sense that I've not met many of my students uh, and have seen them only as an icon on the screen. Um, however, we've got to know each other in, in I think, a very, very special way. Um, so let's just start with the, the title of the, the, um, the studio, Pandemic. As you can see um, by the way in which the A and the I is putting me put in brackets, this is a studio that addresses both the pandemic and AI itself. And in some senses, these are the two key kind of game changers, changes in our culture today. Um, the pandemic, uh, for obvious reasons, um, but AI, so too. Um, and what I find intriguing is the way in which these have in many ways coincided, the introduction of AI and the, um, the, the, first, uh, the, the first kind of pandemic that many of us experience in any, any case. Um, back in 2019, I published um, a paper at Acadia talking about uh, how AI had just become of age. And I made a remark at the time about um, how there was an overlap between the, uh, in terms of timing um, between uh, the, the movie um, uh, Blade Runner and the introduction of AI. Blade Runner, of course, had not as not AI agents as such, but bioengineered robots. Um, and what was intriguing from a kind of time perspective was that the moment at which AI really made it onto the architectural scene roughly coincided with the moment at which um, AI was introduced into architectural culture. Um, in 2018, uh, uh, Refik Anadol had a project projected onto Frank Gehry's Walt Disney Concert Hall, a moment when, when AI was projected large scale onto uh, a very significant building. And about, with, that was in October 2018. And by October 2019, we found ourselves in a situation where the first ever exhibition um, on AI and architecture, The Architectural Beast, um, curated by Hernandez Alonso, um, opened in France. And I uh, uh, called upon this coincidence in terms of timing in my paper in Acadia, drawing attention to the fact that uh, November the 19th, 20, 22nd were the dates on which Blade Runner supposedly uh, had taken place or was predicted to have taken place. Um, but there is a further coincidence in the sense that um, the pandemic itself uh, was first detected in Wuhan um, in China on the 18th of November, 2019. So these three kind of events, the, um, the date at which Blade Runner was going to take place, the date at which AI really kind of introduced itself into architectural culture, and the date at which the, at which the, the, uh, the uh, pandemic was first detected, overlapped and coincided. And what makes them all very interesting is the fact that they are all in a sense invisible. Um, we, uh, often we don't know when AI is in operation, it surrounds us the whole time. Uh, we have apps on our phone, which are, um, uh, AI apps all over our phone, without being aware of it, we are surrounded by AI. It's filtering out our spam, it's recognizing our friends on Facebook, and so on and so on. It is everywhere in our world today, and yet it's totally invisible. And that, of course, leads to some cynical marketing where people, by, by people exploit the possibility of referring to AI, even though it might not be there. Uh, in the case, of course, of, of the, the, the replicants in Blade Runner, they are not so much invisible, but undetectable from normal human beings. And it takes a very elaborate um, test, the Volkamp test, to actually try and identify and distinguish uh, a replicant um, from, um, uh, from human beings. Um, but they are deadly. Um, the same happens, of course, with AI. We have to conduct the Turing test to decide whether, we, whether it's to try and detect whether AI is there or not. And of course, with COVID, the same issue appears. COVID is in many ways invisible. It's not very clear to anyone um, who has it, but who doesn't have it. Um, and we need to take a very significant test in order to go and um, find out whether it's present or not. So all three uh, are essentially invisible and all three 
uh, need to have to test to detect them. Um, and what's more, from a kind of temp a, a temporal perspective, they sort of overlap in an interesting way. Anyway, that aside, this, these were the, the two main issues that we were addressing in the studio this, this year, um, uh, were the, the theme of AI and the theme um, of, of uh, the pandemic. Last semester, we, um, we had a, a theory seminar where we addressed um, these subjects in some detail, um, uh, drawing upon much of the material in the, in, 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 the, in the previous summer from Digital Futures World when these issues had been debated. Um, this semester, we um, uh, entered into the kind of design side of the, uh, of the, the thesis, and um, we kicked off the semester with a three-week session with Daniel Bolajan, who is, I'm delighted to say, here today, um, <clears throat> on style GANs, um, uh, uh, cycle GANs, and picks to picks. Um, the review of that, that took place in the fourth week, um, and then we started the, the, the studio proper. And students had, had, the, had the option of either pursuing AI um, or uh, pursuing the pandemic in some way, or pursuing both, or indeed pursuing their own line of inquiry. Um, and it, it evolved in this way. Um, so let me just first of all say, <clears throat> say a few things about our guests. I want to start by mentioning um, Marina. Um, Marina has been it's been a delight for me personally to um, have been working with Marina this semester. I know the students uh, greatly appreciated her. Um, and she has been part of the first cohort of uh, doc Doctor of Design students um, here at FIU. Um, an enormously capable person, also a very talented uh, studio instructor. And, and I, 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 I will maybe maybe the students will be able to tell you better than I can what a wonderful student instructor she's been because it's, it's been a particular delight. Um, anyway, um, turning to the reviewers, let me start off by mentioning Daniel Bolajan. Um, Daniel is not only a good friend and colleague, um, but uh, he uh, is now teaching nearby at FAU, Florida Atlantic University in Fort Lauderdale. Um, he was for a while a, a visiting professor at uh, FIU. Um, and we miss him greatly. I, I want to first really thank him for this astonishing workshop that he gave, um, um, which has which proved so popular. Um, and Daniel, I, I've been working in this field. Uh, AI. I'm about to publish a book on the subject, an introduction to AI, AI for architects. And I have to say that I think Daniel is probably the leading uh, practitioner within the field of AI for architects. Secondly, um, Ben Asfarahi. Um, who is now teaching, is now taking a teaching post as assistant professor uh, at uh, uh, <clears throat> California State University in Long Beach. Um, with, prior to that, she was doing a, um, a PhD uh, at USC uh, Cinema School, and um, she has been uh, part of Digital Futures, also like Daniel Bolajan, and uh, <clears throat> was part of our, 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 our midterm review. It's, a, it's great to have such a leader in the field as uh, Ben Az with us today. Um, Gustavo Rincon is also part of the, the Key Digital Futures team. Um, I'm delighted that he's with us. He's just completed it, like Benazi, he's just completed his PhD. Gustavo was working um, at University of California, Santa Barbara, um, and he is integral to the whole Digital Futures team likewise, um, and uh, is part of the planning of a big event this summer, um, uh, Inclusive Futures. Shamin Youssef is a colleague of Daniel Bolajan at Florida Atlantic University. Um, she was, in fact, a student of mine briefly for a workshop in, in, in Dessau um, uh, in Germany, where I used to be a visiting professor. And uh, she's, it's great that she's now joined us um, as part of um, uh, um, this particular event. <clears throat> she was also responsible a few weeks ago for a session um, on uh, um, emerging um, uh, female designers from the Arab world on digital futures. And I'd like to say that one of those um, uh, young designers, Aya Riyad, uh, will be joining us later today. Aya, I should say, is a um, uh, teaches at the um, American University um, in Cairo and is a graduate of the AADRL. Also with us today uh, is Ahmed Hassab, who's again been part of the amazing Digital Futures team. Um, Ahmed is in Egypt, uh, in, in Cairo, Egypt today. And uh, he himself was a, was a student of Daniel Bolajan, along with Ben Azfarahi, actually, at last year's Digital Futures um, AI-based workshop. Um, welcome, Ahmed. Um, Malas Fermiso is an old friend. Um, he has been um, at FAU for some time now, um, associate professor, a tenured associate professor. Um, he is also a, a, a good friend as part of a group that we have where we meet up over the 
well, we used to meet up, shall we say, uh, Maui Beach Urban Meetup, where all the computational, some, leading, some of the computational leading, leading computational figures at FAU and FAU would, would be part of everything. Um, uh, Manos is actually in uh, Athens, Greece at the moment, um, but it's great to have him there. Um, <clears throat> on a domestic perspective, um, I'm delighted to have John Stewart here. John has been one of the most supportive um, colleagues at FIU. Uh, he's director of MBUS, um, where we had hoped to have our first um, uh, DDES uh, residential session uh, in, in February. Um, we will be going there in October. And uh, John very kindly was part of our reviews yesterday for the DDES. Um, welcome, John. It's always to great to have your support. Alit Kedan um, uh, is also a colleague of, of, of mine at FIU. Um, she uh, um, was also part of the DDES. She gave a, a presentation um, with, a, with a group of artists, uh, a wonderful presentation um, uh, looking at, at, uh, at the art scene and, um, in, in, in Miami Beach, especially critical about uh, the art puzzle uh, um, world. Um, and then Jorge Tobella, is, uh, 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 who is running the, the robotics uh, uh, workshop um, here in um, at FIU, um, Yoge was actually my first student to start looking at machine learning, and he was the one who really triggered off my interest. Um, uh, he has been fabulous as a, as a colleague, and it's great to have him here today. Um, there will be other uh, colleagues who will be dropping in, parachuting into the session, zooming in, maybe I should say, to the session um, today, um, apart from Aya. Um, also, um, um, uh, we have... Um, um, I'm just going to, uh, we have, we, I'm blanking on the names mode. Um, uh, but uh, one thing, sorry, I also should mention uh, Emmanuel Ko, who is here today from Singapore. We really are straddling the world. Emmanuel Ko is, is, is uh, alongside Daniel, the, one of the leading uh, AI people in the world. He completed his, um, his, his uh, PhD at, at Luzerne, Switzerland, um, and is now teaching uh, in, in, in Singapore. Uh, Prior to all that, he was at the AADRL, and Emmanuel and I go back a long time. It's great to see him here uh, also today. Um, so we're going to kick off. Um, we have uh, three hours for this first session, um, which means effectively a 30 minutes presentation. Um, we're going to have to try and keep strictly to time. I know it's going to be very difficult, but we have to try and do that. Um, we have a three-hour session to begin with, followed by a one-hour lunch break followed by a, 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 an afternoon session that starts at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Um, and uh, not all our colleagues will be able to keep up with us for that. Um, and then for after that, we have what's called the super jury, um, when uh, we will be nominating our, our top student. And uh, Manos has agreed to represent the studio to present um, the work in front of the super jury, um, which is say that the, the all the top students from all the top, uh, from all the thesis um, studios. Um, so I would like to, to I'll, st uh, I'll stop sharing my screen now and invite uh, Matthias to um, uh, to share his screen. So welcome Matthias. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Let me share my screen. Um, so again, thank you. My name is Mateo Stancacci. Uh, oh, just a second. I'm sharing the wrong screen. I've been told. All right. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Mateo Stancacci, and uh, I'm excited to present my thesis project today. Um, actually, I'm, I'm very excited to present my thesis project today. I've been waiting for this for five years. Um, the day that I would go on stage and talk about my, my grand idea, present to uh, a board of jury, um, and got some feedback. But the research that I came across in this past year um, was somewhat disappointing in a way, um, which told me that at some point, no matter what I say, uh, only some of you are going to remember my presentation and most of you are not going to remember what I say or not going to remember who I am at all. Um, and a possible intensifier for that might be the reason that I'm not on a physical stage 
um, presenting this through a computer screen. And you like it or not, there is a, a strong connection between physical space and how we retain memory. So I am looking at the ways that we perceive reality, the way we understand space, the way we form memories. And this idea that neuroscience is bringing of us understanding the brain and how it works in order for us to think, how can we use memories to augment space, create new realities? Um, but before I jump into my project, I just wanna um, explain that this is not a new concept at all. And this goes back to ancient Greece. Um, and um, Cicero actually was talking about this when he told the story of uh, Simonides and the, the story about the, the memory palace. And it's a technique of remembering things that is used up to today. Uh, all those people that are remembering full decks of cards, uh, they are using mental spaces, spaces in their mind in order to understand concepts and retain memory. So, and, and this idea traveled through time and we see it again in the Renaissance in the 15th and 16th century uh, with the memory theater, with uh, the work of Camillo and also in the Renaissance uh, again, same century uh, with the memory wheel by, by Bruno. And even though they're all different um, ideas for how to retain memory, they use the same Loki and Imaginist, the idea of connecting space, connecting uh, physical space with the images, with the memories. So what I'm proposing here is what if we can actually augment into the perception of physical space um, elements of our memories, our own personal information translated into what you would call a cognitive cladding in a way. So first, welcome to the room. This is my room and today is the 396th, I believe, day since quarantine started. Uh, and this is going to be the subject in which I experiment with perception. I try to understand uh, the ways we see the world and how we can use memory to, to create these different versions of the room, these different versions of what we understand as reality. So first understand how to shape perception, we have to understand how we perceive. And neuroscience tells us that as light, light, light bounces on objects, we convert it into electrical signals, it goes to this place called the tamalus, and then it reaches the primary visual cortex. From there, it distributes two ways. One way is the dorsal stream, which goes up, and that's where you interpret space, where position. And the other one is the ventral stream, which per uh, perceives uh, what it is. You actually identify things. But the interesting thing is that the brain is constantly telling itself what it believes it sees. And that's what people like Anil Seth are talking about, uh, predictive perception. You're using what you know, your memories, to understand and perceive the world. And that already tells a lot. You know, your brain is already augmenting itself. So why can't we augment it? So a system for augmenting that would be channeling this light that comes from the environment, creating an external processing based on memories, and then transfer it back. So give back the light to where your eyes are. In a way, externalizing what happens in the brain in order to create this memory versions of reality. And well, I broke it down into three parts. Um, one is creating the synthetic space. How can we take the idea of creating um, the space in our mind, but accessible, you can enter it. So um, using aligned frames, um, I can remodel the world based on depth out of 2D images. So just like your eyes going through space and make sense of what it's around, uh, these models uh, or the digital twins of my room are created then with uh, similar ideas. And the interesting thing is that once aligning this reality with the actual room, I'm able to enter the space, touch every single material, but still have the opportunity to experiment and go beyond what's possible in reality and um, do a couple of tests with per perception. So step number two would be, how do we retrieve a memory? How do you 
access data sets for memory itself. So I'm gonna showcase that with one of my personal memories. Um, I grew up in Brazil my whole life and I came here for college. And um, this is the Ivy house where I grew up. This is me and my brother <laughs> up top of the house. And I cannot go back to the house right now, but based on a couple of images, what I can do is train a language processor um, neural network to um, understand what it thinks the house is. And this on the, the right is what AI thinks my house is when I describe it to it. So basically, um, based on uh, image collection of the house, uh, using a neural network, I can get prompts or text descriptions of what it thinks it sees, probably a building covered in plants, probably a greenhouse. So based on those prompts, running a second neuro, uh, neural network, I can get images of buildings that do not exist. So here I'm telling um, the network to generate rooms made of those words that AI interpreted on my house, creating a whole data set of thousands of images of plant co covered house. So using this generated data set and the frames that I used to build a 3D environment, I can then uh, use cyclegans to actually merge the patterns that make both perceivable. Understanding what a house made of plants would be made of and applying that to the construction of the 2D images. And in the end, getting this uh, almost like a, an Ikea map, you know, a building set for how to re-piece it together and make a memory version of my reality in the United States. And part number three is then this idea of augmenting perception, actually piecing it all together and allowing it to be accessible. And this is the most recent final result. Well, I wouldn't say final because it's always developing. And I believe as AI progresses, one day we're gonna be able to touch, feel, smell and all. But this is my room interpreted by AI. And even though it might not be 100% being back home, there are elements of certain perhaps unconscious experiences that you can perhaps take from this cognitive cladding. Um, and then the idea is to use this prototype. Imagine this prototype being used throughout uh, you being able to collect memories as you live your life and being able to go back or reshape space based on what you perceive. Even if you understand that you're perceiving it or not, you're being you're you're able to shape reality or shape the architectural physical space around you based on who you are and your memories are who you are. Um, so this is a way of personalizing it and um, allowing us to explore because once we can change this perception um, and this is a system that can be manipulated, we can then start manipulating space as well. Um, and in this case, Manipulating space means anything, uh, eliminating laws of gravity, eliminating uh, laws of nature, and um, you know, going beyond uh, what our human perception is capable of. Um, and just to explain some experiments as well, uh, the idea that our bodies are full of these techniques for us to interpret space, including the ways our, our eyes are able to focus on specific things and defocus and pay attention. And by extracting also some of these, you're able to explore within the one room what you focus on or not. So this orb in a way is how your, your, your lenses are focusing on things and you can choose what to perceive, what to explore, what to look forward and what to ignore what to purposely stop perceiving. And then once building enough memory spaces or memory realities, the idea of how do you access it? How do you go through a library of memories to choose from? And the chosen method in this um, prototype is the mirror because, well, not only the car talking about the mirror and how uh, seeing yourself as an object in the field of objects um, is, a, you know, in a way, um, expands your, your understanding of self. 
Um, but also mirrors are already portals into other realities. It's a surface that allows you to see the same world through different, different perspectives, different eyes. Um, so using um, the mirror to augment how we actually see the other realities and access it. So in a way, creating a network of different, different versions of what we have as one little space uh, and expanding our perceptions in the sense of where we could go, what we could explore and activating memories that perhaps don't even exist yet. So, um, so the idea in the end, having this um, memory palace that is accessible, you can travel through and it, it is 100% shaped on who you are. Um, thank you. Thank you, Majes. Um, let's um, open up to some feed, to some comments. I, I'll, I will try and keep my be in the background most of the time today. So, um, um, yes, uh, comments. I'll, I'll just jump in, uh, Matthias. I think this is. Um, it's really, it's really fantastic work, and I, I love the way you're describing it. Um, I, I think that it's the beginning of something, but it's not necessarily the beginning of what you, what you're describing it as being right now. Um, I, I kind of think that it's a, um, that that understanding you're kind of forming an inspiration palace rather than a memory palace. And I think you're forming um, images that are inspiring you based upon things that have inspired you in the past and that are kind of making you like your, like your house in Brazil that makes you kind of happy or uh, interested in the connection between architecture and nature or the landscape or this interconnection. And so that kind of becomes a new way of envisioning your own room and your own, which I think must be, have been for you when you were discovering that. And I haven't, I'm new to this process for, with you, but I kind of feel like that's something that's incredibly inspirational for you. It must be uh, because it kind of connects worlds for you and connects um, possibilities. And uh, so I think that this, what you've touched upon is kind of tapping in maybe to your inspiration that, uh, and direction and kind of how you kind of form connections that might, might be latent, but not necessarily kind of expressed. So um, I, I really wanna congratulate you on a, obviously a great year of work with Neil and uh, you, you seem, you get a lot out of it. And um, I'm very interested in where this will take you because I also think these images are very provocative and unusual in the way that they're kind of uh, granular and kind of, they're not slick. They're not like the way that we're thinking about, I don't know, a lot of other practices today. So I think you're onto something great and I really wanna congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthias, and uh, and uh, I, I really liked your project. Um, I actually started writing down kind of the steps that you were going through. Uh, you know, one, the space scanning, two, uh, the image collection with CycleGAN, and three, the AI cladding. And then you actually stock, uh, talk about the manipulation of data. And it seems as though that you were talking about the interface or the mirror. That's the, the way that I kind of cataloged it. It was, um, for me, it was a really be a beautiful project in that it speculated a certain type of hypothetical. Even though you prototyped it, there is potential. And then I started thinking about our roles um, as uh, builders and also uh, figuring out what type of building we're we're doing here. So this is kind of a virtual building or a kind of a schematic. Um, and then I, th I thought about material. So it seems as though that there is infinite amount of possibilities with the manipulation. So I maybe my question would be on step three, when you go through the AI cladding to the interface, what type of manipulations do you think are 
uh, or mathematical manipulations are closer to you in your memories or your research? And then how does that influence your, let's say, spatial construct? And then going back to the human, how does that influence the human? So do you have structures that make you happier or sadder, more agitated? So if you have to finish a project, are there jaggier memories that make you more agitated? Uh, or do you want to go to sleep and do you have more relaxed memories? Can you please comment on that? Yes, of course. Um, I actually did some substantial amount of research on heart rate variability, uh, which is a, you know, in a way, a unit of measure to, to see uh, your cognitive status in the sense if you're being cohesive or uncohesive, if you're being um, uh, appreciative or frustrated. Um, and I got around to actually get a heart monitor and uh, experiment with that. And in the sense of being able to train data, um, thinking of the ideas that people are wearing Apple watches, people are, you know, uh, in contact with uh, measuring devices all the time and understanding patterns in the real world that activate certain biological feedback might be one way of storing information such as, you know, um, the actual, um, even with leather scanning that understands space around, understanding the potential um, environment or context that they're situated associated with that biofeedback. So in a way, um, when you are in this space that can respond to how you're feeling or the specific um, bio signals that your body is giving, then you can trace back to that data set of memories that has associated with uh, bio signals to respond to how perception changes. Um, of course, this is a prototype and I, I couldn't get around to do 100% and I understand that it's not a complete project. Um, but the idea of uh, stimulating agitation and all depending on biofeedback uh, is definitely a necessary path for this. Well, I, I just want one interruption. So when you talk about the idea of not a complete project, I mean, there have been movies and, and whole series based on sentences. So can you maybe give me three sentences on why this project is so personal? Um, I would say forward thinking. And then what is the contribution to architecture that you're making in this project? Well, um... I believe one, uh, we're going into a new world where people who are gonna be in power of changing our realities um, can uh, completely change it. If you've seen 10 days ago, uh, then Neuralink released a video of a monkey playing video games with their minds. Uh, the level of uh, research going on with the actual brain is insane. And in the past three decades, we learned more about the brain than we had ever known in the history of humanity. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying with this is the potential of incorporating more and more and more this level of research with how we understand space and merging that with architecture uh, is only the beginning. And of course, ANFA is doing that beautifully right now. Um, but that's the path that I, I thought it's the most uh, forward thinking in the way of if we know how we are as human beings, we should use it to construct the environment around us and, and use that to shape. So perhaps even though it's speculative and it's not a project that could be taken to the city hall and be built today, um, it's a, a shot in that direction. And um, I, I really think this is where we're marching and I, I stand by it. Uh, thank you for your answer. So, Mateus, I, I also want to say that uh, this was a very uh, well presented project. It was uh, some beautiful kind of visuals, but also kind of very seamlessly done, almost too seamless to the point of I really don't want to get into the technical aspects of, you know, data sets and AI training and, and so on. But there were some um, really interesting moments, particularly the revisualization, the interpretation from the neural network of your room that as a visual, it stayed with me. And I think what's, what's interesting is that correlation of if we look at this as a kind of possible future application where for example uh, we could revert to clients understanding or 
collection of a catalog of their memories and relying on that to you know produce some kind of possible let's say starting point about the possible design scenario uh, that, that could be one direction right but i think it goes beyond that to the fact that memories are, are distinguished between declarative and non-declarative where non-declarative ones are more the ones we cannot really describe and are more associated with our motor skills our muscle memory emotional memories and so on so i'm wondering if you could comment on uh, and I, or if you consider uh, the, the possibility of going beyond the actual parts of which can be cataloged to being able to access uh, those parts of our memory which are not immediately uh, you know accessible and, and are more latent right because i think this could be even more interesting to to design parts of uh, or to design a, to refine a, a design scenario based on someone's uh, deeper understanding of themselves of course memories are not always good memories and so i think this 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 can open up a lot of you know complex uh, this parts of the discourse but i think it's kind of interesting to me to see how you know a lot of a lot of doors are are possibly opening up about the complexity of you know cognition and uh, the different kinds of memory no, absolutely. And even uh, you saying reminded me, uh, there is this artist called Sofia Crespo that did a whole a collection of artwork based on uh, trauma generated by AI, um, which is the, the part of the bad memory and um, uh, extremely interesting. But um, yeah, um, this and this idea also that uh, potentially the usage of, you know, understanding clients and understanding other people. Um, the ability that perhaps you could go in my room and uh, perhaps understand certain things or understand some sort of visual um, explanation or visual representation of a specific thing. Perhaps the visuals that I presented are not there yet to show that level, but the idea that we are constantly receiving information, whether we're con uh, conscious of it or not. And even when we don't um, register that as a, a declarative memory, it's part of the, the pool of information that is shaping our behavior in a way. Uh, I believe that in, uh, in a system that is able to understand how you're feeling and understanding the context around you is a, a beginning step to uh, introduce this idea of non-declarative memories as a possible um, a factor to to how we behave um, and perhaps you're not even aware that these are the contexts that are co uh, causing it but um, it's shaping how um, this augmented reality uh, mirrors uh, what what uh, affects your behavior I don't, I don't know if that was clear uh, Uh, hi, Mateusz. Uh, I just want to start, uh, start saying um, congrats. Uh, I think it was really uh, an amazing uh, uh, research that you conducted here. And I think this could open up a, a lot of opportunities, like a lot of great ideas to uh, develop further in the future, which I think in the end, that should be the goal of any uh, thesis project, let's say. Uh, it's not just to uh, finish a project to close a chapter, but mostly to open a new chapter that probably are going to continue in the future. Um, I think it's really great. I mean, you're touching or indirectly, maybe you, you start to touch on certain super interesting ideas about almost like this kind of uh, active interpretation of space. Uh, that this because usually we have this kind of understanding of space like as something that it's freezed in a way and you have a certain interpretation of it and of course based on our prior experiences we are going to read that free space let's say in a certain way but in your case that space is not freezed in a way or at least the way that you're presenting it i don't know if this is exactly uh, what you intended here uh, but that space doesn't feel to be uh, freezed yeah so you have also the uh, perception of it that is not freeze that it's uh, uh, ever evolving in a way and also the space itself yeah i think that's something interesting um maybe i cannot put my finger on it exactly what what that is right now but it could be a very interesting in a way a line of uh, inquiry let's say in the future like how, how we think about those kind of spaces that because probably in the future also in the context of of um, uh, COVID, 
might be that we are going to rely a lot on uh, digital spaces, yeah, not so much on physical spaces. And those digital spaces, then maybe they 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 change in in their uh, content and so on, you know, and then our perception how that changes and so on. Uh, here, I also want to touch on a few other things, like when it comes to, and I think also uh, Gustavo pointed out a few things about um, dreaming. Uh, but first, if we go back to uh, to what memory is, yeah, usually we can describe that memory as a sort of uh, reconstructive process, because what we are doing actually, uh, uh, we are we are in a way trying to reassemble in a way memories past memories and we try to put them together and that's what what we think of uh, memory is it's not necessarily a videotape where we just replay in a way uh, our past you know ideas and many times we are reinterpreting in a way the, the memories through uh, present filters in a way yeah and then the other side which is i think because right now i think you are playing somehow in between these two main ideas of memory and uh, imagination yeah uh, because we say that you know memory it's a reconstruct a reconstructive process while interpretation we see it as a, as a constructive process where where we start to uh, to put all these uh, memories together in a novel way yeah or these components in a, a very novel way and I, I see in a way mostly your your project feels in a way uh, more as a imagination I understand that it's mostly challenging perception but that challenging of perception leads to, in a way, certain novel ways of interpreting uh, or, uh, re, uh, or rethinking about certain memories, yeah? So that's, that's probably, um, it's not that it's something bad. I think it's actually something super interesting, like to, to work in between those two. It's not necessarily a memory, it's not necessarily pure imagination, it's somewhere fuzzy in between, yeah? And I think this is also something interesting about augmentation. Uh, we re recently had a discussion with uh, with Kupiyonabla about this aspect of are are we augmenting something? Is augmentation something super precise, or something that actually gives us uh, uh, more fuzziness that we need in a way in this kind of processes, uh, like design processes? Do you do you aim for AI to uh, to give you precise answers, or do you uh, aim for AI to create a sort of fuzziness that allows you in a way freedom to explore even more? Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's uh, one thing there, and I think the other the other thing that also uh, Gustavo was pointing out when it comes to dreams, it's also this kind of uh, seminal in a way finding neuroscience that uh, uh, this kind of idea of uh, offline experience uh, replay in a way. So uh, you can say that uh, the bio biological brains during sleep or quiet rest. They uh, they start to replay this kind of uh, temporal patterns, like uh, almost like for example, there was this experiment with rats uh, running through a maze, and um, during sleep or uh, or uh, quiet rest, the rat will start to in a way uh, rethink, or the brain of the of a rat will start to rethink all the previous steps that it took. Yeah, and that's in a way something that. Uh, it's almost like the the uh, the brain it's reimagining the past movement and using them to optimize in a way for their behaviors yeah so then you know a, a rat that let's say uh engages in that kind of activity during sleep is going to be able to uh to solve that maze uh, better than a rat that is not resting yeah so i think that's also probably an interesting uh, idea to also bring in this kind of uh, uh in this kind of research like how which is the role of the dreams in a way in this kind of um, interpretation and understanding of spaces? Yeah, how is that influencing? Because if you, if you have this kind of rest and, and quiet resting in a way period, probably what you're doing, you're reinforcing certain ideas, yeah, certain ways of how you perceive in a way space uh, or certain memories that start to be reinforced and or maybe they're, they are start to be shaped differently. So it'll be interesting in a way, and this is not not at all something like to say that your uh, research that you've done until now is not amazing. What I'm saying mostly, I'm just pushing forward. Yeah, uh, it's always the the correct direction. It's always forward. Yeah. So here, probably in the future, uh, once you continue in a way with this kind of line of inquiry, maybe you start to think of also of this kind of aspect of how do I bring in a way also this kind of element of of uh, sleep. For example, yeah, because perception, perception, yeah, but that perception also is affected 
through the, by this kind of uh, phases that we have as, as biological beings of sleep, of uh, quiet rest in a way. And what, what will be the impact in a way of those on the perception? And it will be interesting to see in a way, uh, let's say the first cycle, yeah, I start to, uh, to uh, um, imagine in a way certain things based on memory. And then I have a period of sleep and how that affects in a way the new interpretation now of the space and then the new interpretation and new interpretation and so on, yeah? So that's that's why I think it's super interesting because it's this kind of like active interpretation. It's not something that it's static uh, and also the space maybe might change according to that. Uh, but anyhow, thank you. Really, really, uh, really great presentation and, uh, um, and really interesting uh, research. Thank you. And I just want to comment, uh, it's interesting that you brought up this idea of, oh, is it memory or is it imagination? And I would argue that uh, it, they have less differences than, uh, than you would think. And I believe uh, most people, uh, a lot of people actually talk about it, but the, the feeling of finally remember something and finally figuring out how to do something are extremely similar. And, uh, you know, where, where do these thoughts come from? even memories and ideas, uh, you know, at some point they just emerge and we're not conscious about this, this, you know, this appearance and disappearance of, of them. So I would argue that remembering something from the past and remembering something from the future might be, although it sounds uh, fiction, you know, this um, really similar thing that we should, we should treat uh, together. But thank you, thank you for your comments and um, thank you so much. Yeah, so I think the reason why I was pointing to imagination mostly is because is uh, this idea of uh, spatial coherency problem, yeah, that you have in uh, uh, neuroscience usually, and uh, in your case, it's like still even if uh, you have completely new interpretations of that space of uh, or you are perceiving completely differently the space, there is still a spatial coherency to it, yeah. And mostly that's connected to imagination. And usually uh, it says, uh, I mean, if you look at patients with Alzheimer, they have exactly this problem. They cannot create or imagine uh, a space that is coherent, yeah? Uh, so if you ask a uh, Alzheimer uh, patient like to, um, let's, let's say that you just uh, set the scenario and you're saying you're on a beach. Uh, give us, in a way, the, uh, the details of what you see on that beach, uh, almost like asking it to imagine. And uh, that that um, patient will not be able to do that in a very coherent way. Yeah, it might say that, you know, I see uh, uh, an industrial complex and I see a bar. Okay, that's quite coherent, let's say, because, yeah, you have uh, on a beach, maybe you have a bar and so on, yeah. But m most of them, they have a really uh, big problem to create a... Um, uh, coherency when it comes to the spatial composition of what they are uh, describing, yeah? So that's why for me, I'm, I'm really addressing it as almost like a imagination more than just memory, because uh, a patient that has Alzheimer's, for example, has uh, the, the memory, let's say, it's a damage, and they cannot remember things, and therefore they cannot imagine things, yeah, because they cannot remember. We're going to have to, to move on. This is, I mean, a fantastic project, and I think it could be, it, we could talk forever about it. Maybe um, we've got some many final comments from one of I've our... I've got a comment, quick comment. Yeah. Um, I, thanks. I just, Mateus, I really enjoyed your presentation, and um, I just wanted to point to, like, one... There was that image that you showed or that video of you rigging up your room in order to capture the data from the room in order to create the, the new image. And it started to suggest kind of that feedback between the physical and the digital that um, like the, the way that your room transformed in order to like kind of input into AI, it, it made me think about how then, you know, like what that physical feedback would be. So like what you presented to us was the digitized version that lives on a screen or through a device. But I'm also really intrigued with how you would develop that work into ter in terms of like how it lands and what kind of spaces you create with that. And so, uh, you know, for instance, like when you do talk about augmenting, like, well, it's about creating a, 
creating place, like as a designer, as an architect, I'm, I'm really interested in how, you know, how this starts to create new kinds of spaces or, or kinds of sh shifts, the kind of um, way we think about space so that there maybe is a, a certain kind of dynamic quality, a certain iterative quality to it. And uh, so I don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't know what I'm, um, you know, where that leads to, but that was just something that was suggested to me in those images that you showed that, that I thought is pretty exciting about this direction of work. Maybe I, I could just kind of like maybe add something. I think the, to my mind with the, the I mean, it's this beautiful work, which is it's really I mean, exquisite anyway, but I mean, I think the thoughts going into it is very, very impressive, but it's worth thinking, well, what exactly do we have here? I mean, uh, and it's interesting because it's not so much a design so much. It seems to be um, uh, something else. It, it seems to be a kind of um, almost like a sanctuary within a sanctuary. Um, you're in your room. Of course, we've all been in our kind of rooms, our sanctuaries in many ways over the past uh, um, uh, year. Um, and yet you, what you're doing, you're kind of reinterpreting it through the lens of personal memories. So it's kind of like a sanctuary within a sanctuary in some ways, a kind of a VR experience within a, within a, within, within a physical experience. And it's worth thinking, well, what does, actually, what does this actually lead to? I mean, I can imagine uh, that for a, it's, it's kind of, a, it, it's extremely reassuring. It's like a cocoon in many ways, which is kind of maybe, it's, a, it's not necessarily what you would see, but it's something, it's a vision that is evoking possibly certain personal memories that give you some kind of reassurance of, 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 of your, your existence or something. And it's worth thinking, well, what is it in terms of a, of a client? What are, you, what, what are you presenting here? Um, uh, and I think it would be kind of very interesting to see it as, you know, obviously through a client, a client would be able to upload or give you certain kind of visual um, image material that then you could process in this way and allow that client, client to reimagine the physical space in which he or she is through the lens of these kind of personal memories, um, which is something maybe we're doing anyway, the whole time we're kind of, every time we see something, it probably triggers off some memory of something in a kind of Proustian way, um, the kind of uh, the Madeleine cake experience when you, you taste these cakes and suddenly transport you into this other sort of world. So it's worthwhile thinking, um, what is this exactly? I mean, it, it sounds kind of a crude thing to say, but but what is it? Uh, and uh, it seems to me that it is some kind of comforting cocoon that you're presenting for people um, as a way of rethinking where they are and reimagining where they are in a kind of with a certain sense of of, of a reassurance because you're evoking past memories. Um, but maybe just a question: What is this? Maybe I could ask that question: What is this? Um, I believe uh, most of all, it's many things. Um, but one thing that um, I at least told myself at some point is uh, to create a way of getting lost within this tiny four walls, um, which was almost like a challenge, um, you know, through like the change of perception and allowing to explore. Uh, but in a way, it's um, about getting to know yourself. Um, I believe um, this idea of visualizing uh, something that perhaps is not even conscious to me uh, was was an interesting thing to look at and perceive uh, and perceive and uh, and explore. But what I believe that the overall overarching end of this is the ability to, uh, as we progress towards this world where we're going to be able to communicate with our brains better, uh, how that informs the space for us individualized um, space in general. And I believe that's the, the, the end point, you know, what is, what is my room and what, and then thinking, you know, future uh, progressions of this, um, how can a shared space be made by the combination of all of these different people with different memories? How are the space then morphing to the input of different people and creating combinations of these perceptions? And I can get a glimpse of yours and you get a glimpse of mine and every time someone else comes into the space it, it changes again and becomes you know a shared moment and i believe these ideas seem a little far-fetched now but it's going to be clear that in a couple of years we're going to start seeing spaces like that uh, and uh going back to elite 
when you mentioned, oh, what is the purpose of this in an architectural space? The, it wasn't my purpose for this research, an actual, you know, uh, architectural necessarily uh, as, as we know, but one, one type of space that at least draws to me uh, for this type of research was, um, I believe it's called om ominous spaces. Uh, I'm probably wrong. Uh, it's the type of building that serves no religion, but all religion. Um, it's a space that you go to find yourself. Um, they have them in airports and, and different places. And, uh, but it's basically a place that welcomes all. And it's a, a space for you to be with yourself. Usually it's just a room uh, just for you to be um, with your thoughts. But the idea of creating spaces that you can, you know, see your own understandings of the world and see other people's and merge them together is um, what I believe could be a natural place that you go to to experience that. I, I just, I just think. That, I mean, I think that. Uh, I, I mean, it's John Stewart's comment at the very beginning. I think it's, it's at the start of something, and I think this is, to my mind, the key here is to try and imagine. Well, I think, for example, this certainly could be doctoral research, and I think it's very, it's really, very, very rich. Um, but I also think that maybe from a kind of practical point of view, we might be able to think about how this could be, uh, could be some kind of used as a sort of. Um, uh, in the end as a design tool how could you imagine a space that would evoke for your client certain sets of memories and, and give a certain kind of sanctuary in some ways um a very kind of personalized kind of space um uh, or indeed how what could one maybe reinterpret it through projections and things in terms of a particular kind of space uh, 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 your existing space so it, it's got lots of potential um uh, congratulations, Matthias. Uh, we're going to have to move on to uh, Leisure now. Um, uh, if we've taken we've taken a long time on this one, which is it's definitely worth. It's a beautiful project, uh, but we we have to move on. So thank you so much, and uh, could you thank you all maybe, very much? Yeah, could you unshare your screen and, and Leisure? Could you? Uh... Yeah, hello. Good evening. One second. Did you take it off? Okay, sorry. Me and Matthias are in the same room, so uh, our audio is echo. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lija, and today I would like to talk to you about the future of design education. So let's begin our journey in the context that we find ourselves in today, a world that has learned to adapt to remoteness and isolation. Traditionally, in a collective studio environment, we would communicate with our peers while designing and receive feedback from one another. Uh, studio culture fosters the ability of interaction between students and acts as an incubator for knowledge. Without the shared workspace, we have been constrained to a monotonous routine, observing static lectures and removed from opportunities of interaction. Moving forward, we should begin questioning which are the best methods of learning. According to the Multimedia Learning Theory by Richard Meyer, people can learn more deeply with a combination of words and visual cues. The cognitive process in this type of learning involves bringing materials from the outside world into the working memory, and then integrating selected materials with existing knowledge by building connections between new material and prior knowledge in the long-term memory. Today, Virtual reality is widely utilized in education because of its ability to make what is abstract and intangible, concrete and mani manipulable. This technology has been mainly utilized in science and mathematics, but in re recent years, its application in architecture has significantly increased. Furthermore, studies comparing textbook learning, video and virtual realities have shown that participants exposed to VR have better knowledge retention in the long run. Meanwhile, the development of artificial intelligence has enabled the ability of dialogue between humans and machines, leading to the development of several virtual personal assistants that are utilized today by many. The growth of this technology has enabled the creation of several applications by major companies, such as Amazon, which provides advanced deep learning functionalities of automatic speech uh, recognition and natural language, understanding to recognize intents, enabling developers to build applications with engaging user experiences. 
Studies are currently being conducted on implementing more modalities to virtual assistants, just such as gesture and image detection. So why integrate these technologies, uh, virtual reality and speech recognition? While the potential benefits of virtual reality for architecture education are vast, to create, create an augmented experience, we need to think back to one of the main components that enhance the learning process, communication. This is not to say in-person interactions are any less important, but in order to question how we move forward with the current technologies available to us, how can we integrate communication with machines into virtual environments? Let us propose a scenario where students can speak to their computers while fully immersed in a different reality, a scenario where they can express their intentions and witness an immediate response from the system. To have a bit better uh, visual presentation of the scenario, let's begin by watching a series of studies I have conducted to understand the potential of speech-driven environments. And let me share again. Okay, share myself. Forward. Forward. Back. Up, down, rotate right, rotate left, move, move, shift, orbit camera around the space. Take me above the building. Take me beneath the building. Take me far away. Make this wireframe. Make this green, magenta, blue. Make this black. Make this magenta. Black, yellow, Okay, after conducting these studies to understand how to uh, move things with my voice and change materials with my voice, I then moved to speculate how this technology could be implemented in the design process for architecture. So uh, part of this is only theoretical, but uh, these are some of the explorations uh, that I figured could happen if we were to implement this technology in architecture school. Welcome back. What project would you like to work on today? Show me the project in New York. Opening project labeled New York. Show me the landmark buildings around the site. Show me the accessibility to the site. Highlight the site. Zoom into the site. Okay, drop me off here. Show me the project brief. Project requirements, program, sustainable hotel. Maximum height, 100 feet, four to seven floors. Take me to the massing station. Welcome to the massing station. Select your preferred shape to begin modeling. 
Select cylinder. Cylinder. Scale down on z-axis to 0.5. Scaling down. Make a vertical linear array. Creating array. Offset shapes on x and y axis with a force of 0.5. Offsetting by 0.5. Okay, make a second iteration with a force of 1. Offsetting by 1. Stretch the shape vertically. Stretching vertically. Try the second iteration with stretch cubes instead. Changing base shape to stretch cube. Add two vertical components. Added two vertical components. Okay. Select massings 3 and 5 for the New York project. Now take me back to the New York project. Opening project labeled New York. Show me massing option 1. Displaying massing option 1. Could you run a wind simulation with the average wind speed of New York? Beginning wind simulation, predominant average hourly wind speed in New York varies throughout the year, wind is most often from the north, the average annual wind speed is 8.3 miles per hour. Okay, can you simulate the wind impact on massing 2 now? Beginning wind simulation. Which massing option would perform better at this site? Openings along massing 2 allow for better wind flow. This option would be optimal for the site's conditions. Okay, take me inside the space. Make this building be made of bubbles. Generating bubbles. Make this building fade away. Shattering building. Show hologram of the building. Loading hologram. Make building react to sounds. Loading frequency detection. So I would like to end by opening the floor up to a conversation. Uh, do you see the potential, the potential of integrating these technologies in architecture education? How can we begin to wonder what will happen to our learning processes in the future while machines will be able to read our minds? Thank you. Thanks, Deja. I just want to welcome uh, Costas Tazitas um, from Shanghai. Costas is one of the kind of godfathers of the world of computation, and it's great to, to see him here today. Oh, he's just, I think he was here, but he's, Costa's here, yeah. He's gone again. <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, yeah. So uh, let's have uh, some questions. Maybe I can say something. Um, yeah. yeah, this is Emmanuel. Um, so thanks, uh, Dija, for the presentation. Um, nice presentation. Um, my question is, um, if you, I mean, rather than seeing the AI as more like an automation tool, I'm wondering, or the way you present it, since kind of it's always following exactly what you're saying. So I'm trying to imagine how this may be used also from a city planning you know, these days it's kind of popular to have this kind of uh, participatory design where you get different stakeholders to come together to discuss about things in front of a huge model. And what if the AI could, rather than just following a single instruction, it could somehow understand the dynamics of a discussion between among different stakeholders. Rather, so kind of, kind of sort of an analysis sort of thing, but also making it less purely linearly reactive. So instead of me saying, 
something that's really clearly an instruction to left, you know, extrude by 10 meters. What if it is slightly more intelligent in the sense that it could understand the tone of your voice or is able to somehow figure out, imagine the interpretation, even if the instruction is extremely vague. So giving rather vague instructions saying, um, and that's when it gets really generative. In, in this case, it is generative only in, in the sense that it is doing what you're telling it to do exactly. Um, that is uh, one of the uh, things that I thought would be interesting to explore further. And in fact, in, back in, uh, in Singapore, there, are, uh, there is a research lab that basically looking at sarcasm. So the whole research is, sorry, is on that, and okay, it's not part of the architecture department, but the idea is to understand sarcasm from text. So again, going beyond what is plainly stated in text, or in your case, in speech. Um, of course, the speech is more interesting because we could, in fact, interpret the, the tone, the kind of context even. If you are saying the same instruction with a background ambience of, I don't know, a railway station or something. In your case, it looks like a railway station or something else, your background. But anyway, so it could somehow uh, interpret the intended uh, instruction, although not being made explicit. Yeah. But, but I, I enjoyed the way you kind of, the flow of the presentation is really nice. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I think uh, that would be the intention. Um, I was constrained in this specific scenarios to um, uh, learn this technology and understand how to um, command a machine with like a set uh, of rules. But uh, the idea is that if this were to actually, you know, work in the future, it could uh, potentially have a vast database and like the Google Homes or Alexa's there, you know, uh, they interpret uh, sometimes uh, it doesn't have to be like one specific sentence. Uh, there's a range of sentences or intentions and they're able to interpret it better. So if in the future we have uh, a vaster database for AI or even with uh, Neuralink and advancements of uh, being able to just understand intentions by potentially just uh, connecting to your brain in some way, then um, we could have this uh, go beyond what is simply stated and and pick up on intentions and and pick up on um, perhaps even mental anecdotes or something like that. Uh, so it would be interesting to to have uh, this uh, technology uh, somehow integrated in architecture. For instance, the NLP model that you might be using, it would be. I mean, increasingly there has been discussion about you know, the standard biasness or whatsoever. Therefore, language, uh, there may be gender biasness embedded in understanding your instruction versus my instruction, for instance, you were saying the same thing. So uh, I think increasingly it becomes quite necessary to address that issue um, in interpreting that specific tone that might be considered um, sidelined because the way in which the model has been trained. Yeah. Thanks. If I may jump in, uh, first of all, thank you, Ligia. I think it's a great work. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I just want to say that when you asked about like, um, how do you see this kind of embedded or uh, applied for um, architecture education in terms of this virtual space, I think um, I would say that I, I can see potentials of such research uh, into design review like post-design evaluation, if if the professor and students can actually meet in this virtual space and share uh, certain um, ideas. And if AI can help uh, instead of us trying to annotate on Zoom or something that ha have this kind of immediate feedback, let's explore another iteration. But on the other hand, I just want to kind of say that there is a risk of um, kind of this oversimplification of the design process when you're talking to the AI and it does the massing. I don't know if the massing is actually really interesting. I think, so we, we need to be aware, or at, le at least from my perspective, is that it kind of shows a, a different design process that's actually not realistic um, in terms of the complexity and um, this kind of text to, um, 
image or kind of text to model interpretation. I think the design process is much more than that. But I can see a great potential in this kind of review and having AI automate our kind of intentions of uh, rotating the model, um, uh, maybe performing automatic kind of uh, real time simulation and to see evaluation. So it's a design review that is more helpful than actually design process. Thank you. Can, can I just jump in here? Cause I really like that comment, uh, Shamin. I thought they were right. I was thinking like, I remember when we went from uh, evaluating portfolios based upon who had the finest drawing skills to who had the finest gaming skills. And it was the whole conversation about what the future of drawing was. And I could easily see this as the future of drawing in the sense that it, it's who has the finest verbal skills or abilities to articulate uh, direction and kind of uh, maybe it involves what uh, Emmanuel was saying involves kind of controlling or um, managing your your um, sub your more subtle cues about your tone and your you know and so I, I kind of see this as potentially the future of drawing that kind of ex escapes the, completely the world of the of the visual and there's might be if you're talking about architectural education, maybe our beginning drawing classes would then be in your world with your proposed project would be uh, kind of uh, more about articulation and diction and complex and kind of how do you build complexity into language uh, rather than into, and then that becomes through your proposed project becomes complexity in architecture. Maybe I can Building. jump in. Go ahead. Bene. Oh, thanks, Manis. Um, so I just first of all want to congratulate you, Elisha. It's, it's a fantastic project. It has a very clear vision for what is the future of education. Um, just a few uh, comments, I guess. Um, uh, one is sort of like differentiating between the modes of interaction and modes of content production. Um, it seems to me that a, certainly a speech recognition could be an interesting way for interaction. For content generation, I would question that what is the palettes of uh, sort of production of various content. Like for instance, in the video, we are seeing that you're interacting and producing like um, circular objects or rectangular objects and then you transform it to bubble forms. But what other modes of uh, interaction or form generations you have available? I mean, Emmanuel suggested uh, the notion of using frequency, but what kind of line, uh, like is it a SP line or is it uh, a P line or is it an interpolated line? Um, I would say like uh, to sort of like take this project to like seriously make it as like almost a product would be very interesting to focus on various um, ways that you can produce this content for uh, for for your um, uh, for for the for the for the production of architectural form. And then you finish the video by some provocative sentence, which I found really interesting, like how we can connect to the mind. I just want to sort of differentiate again between a speech and mind, because a lot of times what we say, it's not exactly what we mean. And how do you actually, how do you differentiate that? How do you see that um, uh, the intention of what we want a lot of time could be very different to what we say? And how, how do you see that? I guess that's more like a question. Um, how do you see that collide into one another? So for now, it would be with speech, right? And, and the proposal is always speech and speech based. But um, a question that I, I think Neo has brought up a couple of times has been, you know, in the future, how relevant will speech be? And um, with the potential of machines being able to read our minds and so on, how will that affect uh, a system like this, for example? So. Um, I begin to question that as well, just uh, theoretically in my mind, and, and it's not yet, you know, part of the project uh, or anything, but I think it is important uh, to pose that question when um, proposing a speech-driven system. How, how relevant will uh, this speech be in a few years, and how uh, would this be transformed if uh, it becomes less relevant? I think considering also that the, the structure of different languages is very different, right? I think this could be a potential problem, but also I guess opportunity to, to help us re rethink of our own, going back to what Benaz pointed out, like what we 
saying what we mean or what we think is is not always um, the same, right? But going back to also to, um, I agree with a lot of the comments that are, are made and uh, going back to uh, Emmanuel's point about beyond the, the obvious automation to the, you know, that opportunity of asking the machine to offer some kind of vague instruction. I would, besides the vagueness, I would also maybe add the notion of absurdity that is now existing in this kind of process where you have a visual image that, or some, some kind of virtual model and suddenly you're asking the uh, software to convert it to bubbles or into goo or into something like in rubber. Like these are things that we would not, never do as designers, but I think it could almost absurdity of that could also be an opportunity here to begin to question not necessarily in the post design phase, but also in the conceptualization phase, some kind of understanding of how we approach the imagination of, of, of an idea, right? You know, how, if, if so, but, but that's also a double edged sword, right? Because um, it, it could get to the point of being a cartoon as opposed to seriously exploring an idea. But I think the potential of this lies in maybe in a more serious context, cataloging the particular types of vocabulary and ideas. So instead of just saying, convert my design into bubbles, have a series of specific potentialities, you know, which you then explore. And so through that, not always being clear how the AI will interpret it or the, the software will interpret it, you know, something may emerge, right, which triggers our own imagination. So I think it goes back beyond the pure automation of something to how it, for me, the question is, how does it trigger our own uh, cognitive process to imagine something that otherwise would never have been uh, approached, at least in that context. Could I just uh, add something there? I think what was interesting to me was the difference between you controlling things and when it was taking on its own sense of control based on the music, you know, and to my mind, uh, I, I mean, I can't help but see this project in the light of, of Matthews's project. And what was interesting about Matthews's thing about memory is it's, and I want to go back to this really important moment to me, which is Proust's notion of, of um, uh, uh, well, the notion of involuntary memory, how memories can suddenly transport us. I mean, the, the, the story in Proust, uh, à la recherche de ton perdu, of, of him eating this madeleine cake that suddenly transported him into his memories of his past. I mean, that to my mind was, is, is really interesting. And, and how, how do you re relinquish control rather than giving instructions? How do you let the let things uh, 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 kind of manifest themselves that you're not in control of? Sorry, I was just going to make a quick question, a quick comment. Uh, and Ligia, just wanted to congratulate you on the a lot of work to get that presentation together. And when you were talking about the the speech uh, aspect of it, um, the relational quality of it seemed to be really interesting potential in terms of how, um, like right now, it's set up so that it's more com command based. And you're telling it what to do, but it would be interesting if you could start to like just pick up on Emmanuel's uh, uh, talking about the a more generative model that can recognize tone and vague instructions, but also perhaps um, a situation that sets up one where you could have listening and cooperation so that you could actually more both in terms of how you relate with the AI and its ability to process a lot of data, to create a lot of scenarios, to kind of say like, well, what do you think about this? Could it be this, could it be this? So that you kind of can work with the thing, but also relational in the sense of how you relate with others and architecture and design being such a cooperative or needing that kind of cooperation um, and collaboration that it, because I always worry, like if I talk to my device, like if I'm just barking commands at it, if I, you know, how that kind of seeps into my behavior. So maybe kind of setting up a model that's also training the students or training us as well in terms of how we relate with others. And um, yeah, and just agreeing also as well in terms of how maybe it's more, uh, maybe the most immediate benefits are how it shapes the process rather than how it shapes the actual uh, buildings per se, or that the buildings become a result of a process like more indirectly. But yeah, it's super interesting. Like, I just wanted to jump in uh, briefly, but thank you very much, uh, Ligia. 
I wanted to, um, I guess, um, build on uh, Banaz's comments and then also Shermin's comments, but uh, Banaz brought up something very interesting, the idea of interaction and content create, uh, generation. I thought about the idea of product. If we're gonna make it into a product, what does that mean? Um, looking at the history of AutoCAD, <laughs> Uh, you know, why did we not follow up with voice? So why is it so what why is it such a difficult problem? And is it a difficult problem now? And I started doing a search on Google on is there a tool that does speech to geometry? Uh, and I didn't find something very uh, readily. So then there must be some problem there that you can articulate clearly. So uh, for, as a speculative project, it's, it's wonderful. So I remember, I'm not sure, maybe you're too young for Star Trek, but there is an idea of a holodeck and there is an idea of you go in there and you give speech and it says world, it presents a world, it presents a cup. So th that is so abstract, but at the same time, um, I think Daniel's work with um, Dee Pimmelblau if you had someone that has 40 years of database or knowledge, I am sure that those words would have a different level of meaning and deep understanding to a library of, of, of data. So maybe the way that you presented the project uh, is um, kind of schematic, but you could imagine if there's different people in that system, you could say, if I started uh, right now, if I use this system in 40 years as a product, you know, it would give you a certain type of result. And then finally, there's these ethical um, um, like implications. Who owns the, your speech? Who owns your grammar? Who owns the, the data? So I think that presenting this uh, project, um, maybe you could have framed it a little bit better but it is, it does pose some really good uh, provocative questions. So thank you. Uh, can I just briefly add a comment also here? Uh, I know that we have to move on, uh, but just I will be brief. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree also with uh, what Benaz, the points that Benaz was making about um, mostly this kind of phase of interaction mostly and then content generation. And I think here maybe uh, you can try to uh, not to limit in a way your research only to I'm just going to use speech. I can say, OK, I'm going to use speech for this specific in a way uh, task. I'm going to use in a way uh, music for this specific task. And I'm going to use images, let's say, for different kind of tasks. And you can decide then uh, which medium is um, uh, the most relevant for that specific task. Yeah. And the reason why I'm saying this is personally, I'm, I'm not I'm not a big fan of Clip, for example, yeah. And the reason why uh, Clip uh, OpenAI, uh, I'm not a big fan of that because uh, I don't think really that you can uh, create something in special uh, um, in architecture just by words, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, if you think about it, like as humans, uh, if you were to describe to myself to me uh, a, a, a very complex uh, concept through words. I'll have a hard time remembering that, that concept. If you present that concept through an image, it's much easier for me to remember it. And as humans, we are more visual. And I think also architects, as architects, we're even more visual than normal, than normal people, yeah? So a lot of great ideas and concepts are much easily described through images than through text, yeah? Because it's just harder for us to, to contain, in a way, that complexity uh, of of uh, of an of an idea just through text, yeah. So um, in that sense, and you know, it's also that kind of saying that uh, an image is worth a thousand words, or something like that, yeah. So in that way, personally, I see that you know this kind of like text-based approach, it might have in a way a benefit in specific uh, task in design, but we have to spe to be very specific which those tasks are, yeah. But I think uh, it's kind of a stretch to uh, to to try to imagine that actually this is going to be something that you just say some certain words and you design like that, yeah? And that's also, I think, a problem with, usually uh, when you are saying something, you're quite conscious about what you're saying, yeah? Um, 
and design actually doesn't work that way. Uh, usually mo most of the time, like when you're sketching something, you don't actually know exactly what you're sketching. And then probably once you start to see it, you start to rationalize it and you start to, to steer in a way the design in certain direction or not, yeah. So, uh, I mean, understanding in a way how that design process works and where this kind of technology can be useful would be great, yeah. Another point that I wanted to make, it's also uh, a text that is purely technical it's uninspiring. No one in a way gets inspired by a text that is purely technical, like just do this or that, yeah? Just instruction based, no one is inspired by that, yeah? And that's why in a way, this kind of very technical in a way, uh, speech is not very, uh, very uh, persuasive in a way. So people that uh, have, uh, and many of us, uh, we have this kind of skills of speaking in images in a way. So we always, when we formulate and we use certain words that refer to image in a way, and that makes that speech more persuasive in a way, and also makes it much easier for people to imagine things, yeah? And I think also in the context of education then is the same thing. I think a professor that is able to, uh, to, um, to, in a way, put in a way this kind of images in the student's mind it's more successful than a teacher that is simply just, you know, talking about super technical things, yeah? Because the student is more impacted in a way, it's, um, uh, it's more easy for the student to understand certain ideas when you present in a way these kind of visuals in a way, or replace these kind of visuals in the, in the student mind. So I, I, I think these dimensions will be interesting also to, to um, think about when you further develop this. Uh, but anyway, anyway, uh, I think it was a great, uh, great uh, research, and I really uh, encourage you to to push forward and uh, to try to really think of all these kind of details. Thank you. We need to to to, to move on. Because we, we, we... Can I add a quick comment there? Sorry. You... Can I add a quick comment there? Yes, quickly. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Lydia. Thanks for your presentation and uh, the the comments and the reviews. Um, just a uh, uh, quick thing. I believe that you're missing I, the project is great and like you said, said uh, poses some provocative questions, but I think it's a smaller piece of the larger puzzle in design. Um, I believe that uh, using voice to to generate forms is not necessarily the route, but I think the power comes from, especially uh, with artificial intelligence, is the pull of data. So you could use it as a form to start your your design process. Right. And I think there was a left out opportunity because the way I was interpreting your project was to do some virtual reality platform that you're in. So I think the manipulation of uh, of the design in this virtual space and getting real time feedback of what your design feels like in, in a visual and spatial quality is where you're going to get some of the best designs out of and in kind of in this iterative uh, maybe accident approach uh, approach to to design, which is very normal for the way that we design um, where I think their project was most compelling was where you were doing a wind analysis, right? You, you spoke to your assistant to do a real-time wind analysis on, uh, and it was able to provide data that would directly in, in impact your design, right? And imagine that expanded to different levels, you know, for example, where, where are, what type, what type of program is located on an urban scale around this? Is this a urban develop? Is this a, uh, a, a business center or is it residential? Um, what are the uh, codes? You know, how does your design look like and stack against uh, building codes or zoning codes for that area? And then this, your dialogue with your uh, your AI assistant, you know, is kind of interpreting and augmenting your design in real time versus um, how the traditional method is doing designing and then sending it out to a consultant, getting it reviewed. Uh, seeing if, if it meets all, up, up to all these standards, sending it to the client, your loop, your feedback loop is a lot tighter with pulling this information from uh, from your assistant rather than using it to generate form. We're going to have to sort of move on. I'm sorry, this, this could go to a lot, a lot of discussion here. I think it's uh, it's it's very useful. I, I, some of the comments have been fantastic. I, I, um, I, I particularly like the idea. To my mind, what's interesting is, is is when you move from, let's say, a book to a movie. I, I think a book is much more suggestive and triggering off the imagination than a movie which kind of realizes it. I'm always disappointed when I see a movie of a book because of that. But I think that, that, that's, that, that, that it's certainly useful in exposing many of these kind of questions, Legion. It's, it's fantastic. Well, one thing I want to stress is that, is that actually 
those voice commands were actually generating the, the, the images on, on, on the screen. It wasn't a kind of fabrication. So congratulations on, on doing that. Unfortunately, I was going to say that, that I met, had a time lag. I don't know why that was, but the visual, the, the, the voice was coming behind the time lag. I don't know whether Emmanuel in, in, in uh, Singapore had the same problem, which is unfortunate because it, it followed on. It was the wrong sequence. But uh, congratulations on, on this. Let's, let's move on to, um, to uh, Nicole. Um, thank you, Nisha. Um, Thank you all so much for the comments. Hello, everyone. I will proceed to share my screen. Okay. Uh, are you good to go? Can everyone see? Yes. Oh, okay. So, um, just to give a uh, context of what's playing in the background, uh, what's happening over here is that uh, this is a product of using uh, generative models as a data source into a style GAN network. So the, the idea of these is that they're not necessarily representing anything uh, architectural themselves, rather that they're just trying to be suggestive or implicative of different uh, rel formal relationships that uh, come about from the, the, the scripted uh, inputs. And the combination of forms create a sort of organizational system that creates a form of complexity, but from a very rationalized rule sets. So the idea of using these types of uh, generative forms is to depict the possibility of uh, generating multiple design iterations inside a latent space that could be extracted and used as sources of design, design inspiration. A lot of the uh, research uh, began uh, initially from researching uh, Tom Main himself, because he really uh, perpetuated this idea of design thinking through drawing and a lot of his older drawings from his uh, early career uh, depicted that where he would make very abstract spatial uh, uh, organizations in his drawings that they would then be disciplined and rationalized into architecture themselves. And then further on, he the office began to shift away from these types of drawings and go more into the actual uh, generative models where they'll create these types of iterative models that create a, a very large sample set uh, that have a very similar formal language. And this allows the benefit of being able to uh, be very selective and filter out the type of sample sets that have the type of design qualities that you would want in a specific program or um, design. Uh, the issue with this type of design approach though is that it's limiting in terms of the outputs that it, it uh, produces in terms of the language. And it's also not necessarily intuitive unless it's uh, uh, due to the scripted nature of them behind it. So the idea that I, of this project I wanted to do is be able to get the benefits of iterative design to be able to incorporate a more intuitive and uh, understanding uh, connection or collaborative connection with the machines and the computers that we work with through the act of drawing, which is one of the oldest, most natural ways of uh, communicating ideas for designers. And this depicts a little bit of a roadmap of how we can achieve this uh, using um, uh, scripted parametric uh, models and also the help of artificial intelligence through the form of PsychoGAN and uh, machine learning networks using backpropagation learning. So we can start over here initially with the model generators that I created. So the model generators just create two different types of language sets. The first set is trying to depict more of an object generated from volume and line systems. And then the second set of data is generated from uh, lines and uh, uh, de describe a field condition that's generated from lines and points. And then uh, being able to extract all of that um, image output data, you then have uh, the sketch data that is to be generated in order to be interpreting the actual user sketch input that will come later into the process. So in order to uh, prepare the sketch data, I needed to find a lot of data for the sketches. And in doing so, I started looking at non-alphabetic uh, language sets to be able to find something with large data sets with a consistent technique that eventually landed me on uh, actually finding this called uh, kusushiji, which is a type of ancient Japanese uh, hiragana cursive, uh, which is actually uh, uh, almost drawing-like and very simplistic. It's almost unreadable to modern Japanese uh, today when in comparison. Uh, and so I used uh, this as an inference to generate the data sets uh, to be able to uh, teach the network on a type of uh, easy way of understanding the drawing techniques. And to do this, I use the consistent adversarial networks or the cycle GANs. So the benefit of the cycle GAN itself and why it's an extremely useful tool is that it's able to actually learn through unpaired data through cyclical learning, going in between the data sets and learning from each of them. 
And from that, uh, you can see over here, the left is the actual input of uh, the Kuzushiji. And then on the right is uh, the initial generator. <clears throat> and then on the on the farthest right, you get to actually get an input of uh, an output of sketch data that will actually be going to the network that will make the learning much more effective for translating the more complex, um, uh, the more complex generative uh, uh, forms um, to be able to then be translated into the type of uh, formal, uh, into the type of formal representations and visualizations. So in doing so, you can see over here, we have the input on the left, that's the actual sketch input. And on the right, um, you have the uh, volume and lines in the center, and then you have the fields, lines and points on the right that are being translated uh, directly from the actual sketch input itself. So now that we actually have a visualization that is implying something 3D, it doesn't necessarily that it is actually something that is 3D. So in doing so, uh, we go through the actual backpropagation network. So from there, we have two, um, two data that we're gonna extract. One is the shadow analysis for the data extraction. The other one is the actual parameter data that is gonna be from the object selves that is gonna be used in the reparameterization. And as you can see over here, it's actually extracting from the uh, generated images. You get to extract the dark shadows and also uh, the lighter um, contour lines. And by doing so, it is able to use that relationship with uh, the actual parametric data inputs to then be able to, through back propagation learning, uh, try to solve itself to be able to create a direct connection between an image output and actually generate something in 3D. So on the left, it's simply an image that has been given to the network and on the right is an actual three-dimensional object being generated. Um, after 50,000 iterations, it was able to go down to a 16% error value. Um, definitely not the, the, the best for, but it's, it's something that I think will have to be proceed further on uh, to try to get it to be better. But I think it's close enough to at least prove um, the point of the idea of generating an image to get something close enough to an actual three-dimensional object that has been reparametricized through machine learning of the, the, the shadow qualities itself. And then from there, once you get the uh, reparametrized model itself, uh, that's when the point of you actually get something that is an output of an actual sketch input. So the sketch itself is actually, since it's something very subjective and abstract, can then be transformed to something very concrete, to something that's an actual 3D model itself. And that 3D model can then be uh, sliced up and analyzed, and then it can be inspected for certain design qualities that could be desirable for uh, either different sources of inspirations, uh, certain spatial qualities, or certain program possibilities. And it can be sliced up in either plans, or it can also be sliced up in sections and be inspected for certain qualities. And the model itself being a model means that it could be stretched to be taller, shorter, inverted, or uh, manipulated to then actually be outputted towards uh, the actual design development stage from the conceptual design stage. So to kind of end it on the, the, the whole point of the project itself is that uh, the idea of really trying to use AI and computation in a way to create a more collaborative relationship that we as designers have with our own devices that we usually uh, don't uh, use enough as, um, I should say, partners in the design process. We usually use the tools in order to um, simply uh, accelerate certain uh, rational processes, but there's certain uh, possibilities in the creative realm of how they can provide us a higher capability or a higher potential uh, that could expand the speed at which we're able to progress through designs and also expand uh, the potential at which we can look at different ideas of morphologies and forms that could be um, that could be directly influenced by the actual inputs itself. So it's not just direct response to, to the outputs of the computer, but rather the human designer is, an, is able to initiate the process itself through the abstract suggestion of the sketch that might not necessarily mean something. And then the computer will interpret it through AI to actually generate something that is concrete, that then the human designer will then be able to use their interpretive uh, mind to be able to actually discipline it into the function of whatever the designer wants it to be. Thank you. Nicholas, can I just ask you for clarification? What, how does the, the, the I understand the sketch and the, everything emerging from the sketch, but how does the, the designer interact with the process to manipulate it? Could you just explain that further? Uh, yes, so the, the designer is the one who draws the sketch. If I go to the roadmap, I guess, over here. So because uh, the, the cycle GAN learns to interpret the images, uh, it can then interpret the new 
user's sketch input. So the designer can then input a sketch that is brand new that the network has never seen before and then interpret it and then re-parametricize it to a model using the training from the two data sets that it's learned. So then it will turn that sketch to something that is a 3D model uh, or an interpretation of the 3D model based on the training of the AI that then the, uh, the designer can then analyze. So it goes from a human input to then the, the computer output and then the analysis, the human analysis. But is there any intervention that the, 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 the human can make at that point, or is this simply analysis? Well, uh, I guess the, the way I had it was that I didn't want it to just be a single output. So the idea of having these uh, multiple generative models was the idea that um, the computers can give you uh, different filters of which they interpret the sketch. So the idea is that you can have more than two generative models um, that would be interpreting the sketch. And from that, you would have uh, almost like a filter over the sketch of different visualizations of which you can understand it that then the designer can then engage or be selective on. So the idea is that the, the, at least for this stage, if there's no uh, human intervention other than the input. And then based on the selection process, the human then interacts and select and responds back with what it, the AI is generating as an understanding of what it's learned from the sketch. Questions? I'd like to welcome Matthias Del Campo here, um, along with Costas. Um, welcome. I just wanted to ask Nikos to uh, maybe speak a little bit about the meaning of the uh, Kuju Shiji, because um, it, it was an interesting kind of example to, to choose. But since this is coming from uh, you know the hiragana. And, you know, is the, it does the semantic uh, reference of the specific, um, you know, calligraphy have a meaning to you or is it mostly interpreted uh, or used like as a vessel, you know, for the, you know, for the next step of the training process? Because well, in, in, uh, later yes. on, they're, they're replaced by, you know, your own sketches or anyone's sketches, which the cycle gun has been trained on. But does that original source matter? Yes, the, the original source is um, the big qualities that I looked for if I go to the hiragana itself is that it has a very sweeping curves and consistent uh, unbreaking lines. So it was able to be something that I think could be very abstract or suggestive, at least to me, on how I would want to interpret an initial uh, concept drawing. Um, obviously, uh, I, I had initial other data sets beforehand that were a little bit more of um, different quality sketches, some more detailed sketches. But then once they become too detailed, then it starts to get too fuzzy or difficult for the AI to learn. So by begin, uh, leaving them to be more simplified and continuous um, lines and sweeping curves, the AI was more um, effective in learning that. And I think it's also more uh, easy or more intuitive to actually interact with the machine afterwards, because then you're able to actually create some sweeping curves and it would then generate morphology based on that. So that, that was really the reasons uh, behind using this. So when the cycle, when it goes into the cycle again, even though the, the shape of it changes, the reason, uh, the way the technique of which these shapes are drawn um, is learning from that technique of the sweeping curves and um, the continuous line. So it'd be able to try to replicate the forms. Maybe just some comment. Um, so from my understanding, the bottleneck could be the form generator, which is rule based, right? If I understood correctly, that it generate the uh, from your from the diagram that you show. With this, uh, if Sorry, you can diagram. you repeat the, the question one more time? I'm I'm thinking the would the form generator be a kind of a extremely important determining factor. Because if I imagine the form generator is based on the rules that generate rectilinear or kind of uh, truncated lines or shapes, or say instead of blobs, you get rectangles on square, then the input sketch would be would have to be something else. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, it, it would. I, I guess it would have to be in that case. Um, but 
it would have to be straight lines that are inputted because if you give it, I guess, sweeping curves, it might have, it might output something, but maybe it won't necessarily be a direct translation or it'll be a loose translation and it won't be as effective. Um, so yes, it, it really is dependent on the type of sketch you're giving it and the actual output you're receiving. That's, always, that's why I uh, transformed the initial hiragana uh, because when I was running the cycle again with the hiragana itself, um, if I go back over here, the reason why I had to transform the sketches themselves was that uh, these types of uh, looping um, curves that were being created uh, in the, with the hiragana over here uh, and these kind of crossing intersecting lines, it was very difficult for the cycle GAN to be able to effectively create um, a replication of those images or a visualization of those images. Um, and it was just a little bit too conflicting. So I had to almost, um, I had to transform them to be a little bit more imp uh, implicative of the language of the generative forms themselves, which is why I initiated through that initial transformation and then put the actual translation through the cycle GAN. So uh, yes, the, there, there is that connection between them. So depending on the type of data set that you train it on, you also have to put a corresponding or close enough uh, generative model uh, that corresponds with it to be able to get uh, effective results, at least in the way I currently have it. I'm just, just wondering it, whether... Thanks. Sorry, go ahead. Logic of the, the form generator in your case, it, what, what, what are the, I mean, it's essentially rule-based, right? If I understand correctly, the, 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 the training data is for the sketches. And then from my understanding is that you have a parametric model that you then based on some kind of parameters or rules and then you generate forms, in this case, volumetric ones. And then you do a shadow analysis to grab them as images and then pair it back again to the cycle gun, right? If I understand correctly. Yes. So I'm wondering what the logic the form generator. Yeah, so the form generator acts as a, as a it, it acts as a data uh, massing generator so that um, it can have a data set to then be trained on and also the data set for both networks to work on to train both the cycle GAN network in relationship to learn from the sketches and also to train the back propagation uh, network, uh, the machine learning network to then be able to do that translation for when uh, the, the user actually gives it a sketch, then reparametricize it as an interpretation of the AI into something in three dimensions. So it's supposed to be a more intuitive way where uh, the designer can come in and generate or just give the system a sketch that's been trained already and then be able to actually get a few uh, outputs of different three-dimensional forms and different conditions, either an object or a field to then be, to then be used to kind of spark the, the conceptual design stage. Um, and then move on uh, to the development stage. So th that's the logic behind the system itself on why it was designed this way. It's a way to kind of organize this. I mean, the, well, I like the workflow. It's very uh, clever to kind of introduce that uh, shadow analysis as a way to somehow match up uh, to then do the 3D thing back again. Uh, so yeah, congratulations. I, it's a very successful project. And great style as well. <laughs> I like the aesthetics. Thank you. Uh, I was just what we had actually a presentation um, on on Friday where um, uh, uh, one of our our DDES, um, uh, candidates was showing a, a kind of Picasso thing whereby. He went from a kind of drawing of a cow, from a picture of a cow, to the kind of abstraction of a cow that 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 uh, Picasso would do to Picasso's signature. And I, I, it might be interesting to be able to connect more precisely uh, the language of a particular person to the forms that might be generated. I'm thinking in particular of, of, of let's say, Arabic script. You know, someone like Zaha who's coming out of that precise culture. Whether that is in some way evoking or forming or influencing the kind of forms that can come out. I know that, for example, that uh, the, 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 the Farsi has some ex very elegant uh, scripts, and I can't help but think there's some connection between the, 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 the language of the scripts itself and the, and, the, um, uh, and, and, and the forms that come out from architects from that region. I don't know if, whether Ben Az would like to comment on that. Um, I'd also like to, we have Costas here, um, we have the Greek Mafia here, whether Costas would like to, to comment on this. 
Uh, I've been I've been looking at this and um, I have um, a few comments. I think uh, I think I, I I I admire your um, your effort, but I think it's over complicated, way too complicated for no apparent reason. The whole thing is about, as you said before, um, inspiration. I guess that's what it is. It starts as an inspiration from the hiragana, then ends up with a 3D model, which is again an inspiration for somebody to interact with the uh, with uh, uh, the, the the design. But the problem is that uh, inspiration has two types. There is a visual inspiration, which is aesthetics, and then there is intellectual, mental inspiration, which is um, different. So, for example, you can see something and inspires you, but you can also hear a story that will inspire you. Now, once you got into hiragana, I thought you're going to get into the meanings of the language, which is uh, where hiragana is a little bit, you know, touching upon. But uh, even better, it would be more interesting for you to look into kanji. Kanji is the, uh, the Chinese version of language because kanji is intellectual. Kanji or hanza in uh, uh, Chinese is based on symbols that actually have meaning and they're stories. So when you read a story, you actually get inspired about something that is going on as a mental case versus the visual shapes of hiragana, which basically is just visual. That's why it doesn't mean anything. That's why if you put a and ta, and pa, they're not even a, no connection between one another. They're just like scribbles. So they're nice, I guess, aesthetically speaking, visually speaking, but I don't see how the AI would be involved in the sense of the true sense of the word AI, which involves the word intelligence. Intelligence, again, is very different from visual um, stimulus as opposed to intellectual stimulus, which is, uh, I think a little bit uh, different. So again, um, um, I, I, again, I, I think you did a lot of work and it's very good and it's very like, uh, you know, inspiring and, uh, but again, visual. I would like, if I, if, I you, my, if you were my student, I would actually push you into getting something simple, but also something that has an intellectual side to it. Uh, something that is more semantic, more meaning uh, in the sense, uh, uh, Again, and you talk about Tom Main, okay? Tom Main, actually, before he started doing all these works, was, I was a colleague with him back when the time that he had no computers in his office. And he was actually, for the first time, learning how to use Form Z, which was a software that I brought to uh, UCLA back then. And Tom Main was so beautiful, the work he did, when he was doing it on his intellectual ability as a human. Once the computer got into his business, he lost the whole thing, in my opinion, again. I think he lost the whole point because he became too, if you like, uh, uh, dictated by the machine and the aesthetics of the machine. So he lost the intellectual ability that he had originally as a true thinker with his hand, which he is very good in, in drawing. And I thought at that time that I was actually responsible for um, um, kind of contaminating him. So I would say this thing to you Sue, to you too, that you should also kind of like uh, get away from the aesthetics. I think the aesthetics are nice, but they're too complicated. And I think the AI doesn't help. It makes it more hallucinating than it makes it intel intelligent. So that's my comment. Again, it's not a negative comment. It's more like, a, I mean, it's negative, but positive at the same time, because you can actually do these things. I can see that you have the ability because you know, and software is a very hard thing to do. And if you do that, you can be very, very successful. And I think all these things could actually lead to that inspiration, but also something that the machine actually does for you without you. And I think that's where AI starts to become interesting when the machine does it and you don't do it. If you're doing it, it's just not AI, it's IA, which is this inspired uh, intelligence, but not real intelligence that is artificially embedded into the thing that you're making yourself. So, sorry for being long, but. No, thank you very much. Uh, that was extremely insightful criticism. And uh, I, I really, like you said, you know, the, the idea, I, I never thought about the, the kanji in that sort of way. And the idea of trying to extrapolate meaning from the actual symbols themselves to then generate a story rather than something in aesthetics is something uh, more abstract and 
uh, within the realm of the actual design thinking that could, uh, how do you say, it could be an instigator to actually create an original thought to the actual human. Um, so um, yes, it's something that I'm gonna put a lot of thought into it and I really appreciate the criticism. Yeah, just one thing, in terms of Kanzi, Kanzi is so interesting because it has a lot of connection with Greek uh, letter system, the alphabet. And, uh, you know, the way we put the alphabet together in the ancient type of way of uh, syntax is very, very close to the Kanzi. And that is intelligent. That's syntax, that's grammar, that's all the things that are really true intelligence in the abstract way. So I would encourage you exactly to go into the Kanzi, you know, you don't have to learn Chinese, but, you know, just looking at the characters and just opening any interpreter of characters and seeing how they're broken. You know, you see they're like pieces. You know, Kanzi is not one thing. They're like uh, five, six symbols together uh, that compose a bigger symbol. And that is a very interesting way of looking into the meaning behind the text, which is basically the um, uh, intell intell intellectual mental inspiration. We're going to have to, to, to move on because we're, we're way behind time. I, I, I want to congratulate Nico for the, the technical accomplishment here. I mean, it, this is you're by far the most advanced uh, student in terms of computational ability that I think I've taught on, on certainly FIE and the master's program. And it's really astonishing the fact you got this point. I, I, the, the way that this has automatically been generated is you know, the huge amount of work you put into it, the kind of focus you put into it, I think is astonishing. But I think what you have here effectively is a tool that you can use to explore further. You know, you can then input other other uh, other um, characters and so on and, and take it further so i think you're at the start of something i think that the i'd also uh, i'm also very impressed by the attempts to try and get into a three-dimensional realm using the shadows as the geography as it were uh, to 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 inform the, the, the logic of that and be, if we had more time i'd love to hear more about where the successes and failures of that project were because i think that's really a remarkable kind of step and it's really taking us in new directions um so, but we have to, we have yeah. to move on. Can I make just one, uh, yes. one brief comment? Uh, Neil, a great, uh, Neil, uh, Nico, uh, great, great work. Uh, I think uh, we also have to look at uh, his project from this aspect of uh, uh, process, because in the end, what he's doing is mostly developing a sort of process where he's trying in a way to, uh, uh, to take maybe certain inspiration from different domains, domain sketches and so on. And then from there, in a way, create a sort of composition or a sort of output in a way. It's not so much about uh, necessarily like the domain uh, idea or not. It's about almost like this kind of uh, way that as humans, we are also doing the same kind of thing, maybe in a, in a more, uh, uh, not in a conscious way. We are not doing it that way. We draw inspiration from multiple, in a way, uh, examples, architects and so on. And then we, we mash in a way everything through this kind of process of designing, you know, and then we end up with our own in a way solutions, yeah. So here, I think his process is ex exactly trying to do that. It's just that trying to ask a machine to, to, uh, to, uh, to do that kind of process that normally we do all the time, yeah. And I think it's also uh, great uh, because uh, we were we were having these discussions yeah, about types of creativity at one point, yeah, and especially when it comes to computational creativity, like that uh, Borden is also expressing, also Hasabi, it's expressing this kind of idea of interpolation, extrapolation kind of creativity. And in his case, the I think the um, the push is to to go outside of that mode where you just have a machine, one algorithm that looks at data set. And then that uh, algorithm is super conservatory in the sense of it's just outputting whatever the data set is, yeah? So it's not creating something necessarily new, it's just creating an interpolation of the data set, yeah? So in his case, and um, he's trying to move outside of that, yeah? By creating these kind of multiple processes that just draw inspiration from one domain, the other domain, and then when you put them together, the sum is greater, yeah? So I think uh, that's something that has to be really appreciated and I think it's really uh, it's a really uh, um, great to see uh, to see you, Nico, going in that direction. I mean, it's great to see you, uh, Nico, progressing because uh, um, I was uh, Nico's uh, uh, professor like uh, in 2018 when I was uh, uh, teaching at the FIU. So it's it's great, Nico, to see uh, the progress that you made. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, you taught me everything I know that's gotten me here so far. So all of my gratitude is to you. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, uh, so, uh, Christopher, are you ready to present? Um... Yes. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christopher, and this is the Star Architectural Contamination. I have spent my entire life living in Miami, and when I started architecture school five years ago, I always questioned the level of architectural culture in Miami and if it consisted of an overwhelming amount of provocative and engaging work. When it comes to Miami, a complex set of uh, economic, urban, and regulatory systems sometimes seem to leave little room for architectural exploration. Architects often struggle to find a point of entry for inserting their creative perspective in a way that would rethink or progress the typology. The resulting buildings typically reflect the reality of the efficiency driven market, maximized footprint, relentless repetition, and lowest common denominator, design appeal. My thesis is on critiquing the current state of Miami architecture and how artificial intelligence allows me to render a future where Miami is contaminated, contaminated by the works of Tom Main and Wolf Pricks. <clears throat> I chose these architects because they understand the wants and the needs of the city. They respond to the shifting and advancing social, cultural, political, and technological conditions of contemporary life. In order to contaminate the architecture of Miami, I had to train multiple general adversarial networks known as style GAN with the works of these architects. The goal of the general adversarial network is to synthesize artificial samples that are indistinguishable from their authentic images. The program creates the foundation of the image by learning the base features which appear in, even in a low resolution image and learns more details over time as the resolution increases. The style GAN is an extension to the GAN architecture that proposes large changes to the generator model, including the use of mapping network to map points in latent space to an intermediate latent space. The use of intermediate latent space is to control style at each point in the generator model and the introduction to noise as a, as a source of variation at each point in the generator model. My scope of work was focused in on the suburban neighborhoods and the downtown area of Miami and how these areas would be contaminated by these arch architects. I started with the work of Tom Main's practice, Morphosis, and I was able to generate a data set of images from their constructed buildings. I then created a data set of buildings from Wolf Prix's practice called Kupemoblau. I also went driving around uh, the suburban neighborhoods of Miami and also created a data set off of those buildings and the ones from the downtown area. The training process went on for weeks for the style GAN to produce synthetic images of the Tom Main contaminated Miami suburban buildings. Zooming into the latent space of thousands of synthetic images, I chose the ones that seemed that have been contaminated or in the process of contamination. I believe that these results could have, could have been better um, but the, the results that I, I got for um, my, nest, my next test were a, a big improvement. So this is again, uh, the process of the training for the downtown uh, main contamination. And uh, one of the reasons why um, the, there was an improvement in the training um, was a result of the structure of the, the data set um, in terms of how I was creating hundreds of iterations of the constructed buildings and slightly altering them with a Python script to skew, mirror, change, or contrast in color. Um, zooming in, the style again produced the, the results that I was looking for in terms of the downtown buildings of Miami and um, being contaminated by the work of Tom Ng.
after I stopped the training uh, for for Tom Main, I started to work on uh, Wolf Prix's contamination. And um, at this point, I really started to fall in love with uh, what the AI was doing with Miami. And it, it made me realize that Miami could be an architectural paradise under the right hands. And again, zooming into my favorite seeds that were produced by the style gang. then proceeding uh, with the Wolf Pricks contamination on downtown Miami. Uh, it was very eye-opening uh, for me and rendering the future of Miami, um, one that I, I never even imagined. Again, zooming in on uh, my favorite seeds from um, this contamination. And uh, I, I look forward to continuing my research and training the generative adversarial networks to envision and create architecture that isn't focused on the lucrative real estate market of Miami. And uh, I believe that by embedding artificial intelligence into the practice of architecture, the future of Miami will be filled with provocative and engaging work. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just wanted to jump in. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher, for um, your presentation. Uh, I, I guess we have more distinguished uh, guests that this is their primary research, but I'm going to be very uh, brief. Um, it seems uh, it seems that some of the forms are compelling, and I would say that uh, I was thinking about the idea of contamination. So, uh, as a subject of uh, uh, why contamination? <laughs> but secondly, it seems as though that it would have been great to have some sort of uh, kind of typological analysis of what is actually happening in Miami. What is what are you concluding? What is the historical timeline? Where it was, where it is, and how this technology is influencing that change. So um, I lived in LA, so I saw one of um uh, Coop Himmelblau's houses next to the ocean. And that house stuck out so much that I always loved and visited that house. Like, I don't care where I was. I said, hey, I see the house. I go to the beach, right? So now I'm going, well, what are you making here? Are you making that type of place where in, when you go to the beach, you have to go to that house? And then how do you determine that? What is your criteria? And then how do you embed that into the algorithm? And, and you know, M Matthias and Daniel are here, so they can probably speak more to that in the research. But I would leave you with that provocation. Like, what is the measure of great architecture or a great iconic structure that you see in your mind for Miami? But how does this scale and change in different geographies? Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo, for the comment and question. Um, I think definitely um, there's um, obvious, uh, uh, I guess, what I like and what, what um, attracts me into architecture and the type of buildings that are aesthetically pleasing to me. So there's obviously that type of factor. Um, one of uh, the rules that I set for myself in this project was um, <clears throat> to not only make sure that uh, 
the, the buildings that I was using weren't just aesthetically pleasing, but also um, engaging with uh, the community. And they, they were buildings that, uh, that were really meaningful for the city, or they weren't driven by um, kind of like market resale or, you know, maximized footprint. And that's something that you see a lot in Miami and just like a lot of repetition um, for to make to make profits out of. Uh, but I think this this type of architecture um, that by contaminating um, that is making it much better and thinking about how this can be used in the future. Um, well, I think that, you know, from these images, um, you can start to almost uh, think about how you can start making like paneling systems or, um, you know, like exterior finishes or using the the current buildings as a as kind of like a baseline and then building on top of that to create something that is more provocative and engaging uh, for the for the public. I guess Hi, Chris. Uh, sorry, I just had a quick comment and, and a question building off on Gustavo's point about, um, you know, uh, contamination and then also the very selection of a particular term to me is, I don't know if it's, uh, if it has a certain negative connotation or not. I mean, it could be positive contamination or, or some kind of, you know, if we distinguish between parasitical or symbiotic, symbiotical relationship. But I think it, it makes me think about how how architects design with regards to context, for example, and it goes back to, uh, the, the, my question goes back to whether there is a reciprocity between the two AI processes or if they stand autonomously because you chose specifically Main and Prix's work. And I'm thinking if, if, if Wolf Prix was designing in Miami and uh, re next to an open lot, would he design differently as opposed to designing right next to a plot where Tom Main built uh, just a year before, right? Uh, clearly, there is a very strong inherent design instinct that you know any kind of uh, you know mature designer has. But you know, would how do you respond to to existing architecture, especially of this kind of thing? And I'm wondering, just because you were very specific to choose those those two um, those two designers, um, you know, how how could perhaps the AI speak to to this kind of reciprocity? You know, is there is there an importance in terms of the order of the two? Uh, networks, or I don't know if it was just two networks, but it, it goes back to perhaps that possibility of chaining this process to, um, you know, to create, uh, to open up a dialogue, some, something that is more, a little bit more responsive. Yeah, definitely. Uh, no, thank you, Manos, for that, for that comment. Uh, uh, no, these were, these were separate uh, networks. Um, something towards the future, I, I would like to uh, kind of combine uh, the networks and see um, if, the, if the AI kind of understands that in terms of context, the way we see context and how, um, how, conf how context influence our design, um, it'd be interesting to see how uh, the AI would um, see context in, in the world that's already contaminated. Christopher, uh, if I may jump in, uh, thank you so much for the great um, and interesting research. I just wanted to maybe, um, I, I'm going to share with you a paper that I've been recently um, kind of in a, the same session, and I think Emmanuel uh, moderated that session in the Cadria conference. So it's a recent paper on also exploring this latent space, uh, space with uh, style again, and I, I really like the paper. and. Um, what is different from your um, focus and, and the paper is that uh, I think there is this preference to your own stylistic and aesthetics, uh, or maybe what you like about whether Tom May's style or Kup Himmelblau. But I think the research is more about um, actually exploring um, the latest space and how we can interpret it uh, with architectural design alternatives that emerge from this kind of uh, combination of what you what you did with the suburbs or Miami downtown. But in my perspective, even the, the results are really pretty much influenced by uh, the two uh, offices that um, kind of you worked on. And these images are really interesting, but I think when it comes to research, I think the bias um, or the actual preference um, can be also um, filtered or at least kind of in my perspective, um, analyze like why to Maine, why, for example, uh, Coupe Himmelblau, and what exactly was the in intention 
um, in that other paper, they actually wanted to see other qualities in the um, architectural design, uh, um, uh, for example, the urban, let's say, um, uh, language of Miami, for example, you can think about whether if buildings were less in height, whether they were more uh, dry without any kind of, uh, which is actually the case, or there's more natural and vegetation elements, whether materiality was explored differently. So from my perspective, I think there could have been a potential to explore not stylistic or aesthetic preferences, but also other qualities that Miami could have actually had. Thank you. Matthias? Uh, yes, uh, hi. Uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation to be part of this review, super interesting. Happy to be here. Um, it's a great opportunity to talk about some things I'm really interested in um, Christopher, thanks a lot for your presentation. I think this was a really well done, beautiful presentation. The results are stunning. So all in all, really beautiful work. Um, but I would like to dive a little bit into some of the aspects of your project, which were, I don't want to say concerning, but um, provoking maybe in some way, yeah? In that, um, like your title, the architectural contamination in itself already has a, several aspects where I'm like, what? Uh, I'm really thinking that, I mean, first of all, the idea of the star architect, in my opinion, is, is a dying breed. It's something that has been declining. in the dec And that's also why you choose actually two of them, which are, in my opinion, not contemporary anymore. They were stars at some point. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's like this remnants from the 80s and 90s that still roam around in the architecture circles, this idea of the star architect. So this is a provocation. I think it's a good provocation. I thank you for that. Yeah. And the other one, the aspects of contamination. So basically that uh, other architects are contaminating whose work? Your work, the AI's work, Miami's uh, presence and architecture. I think, yes, you made it clear that it's about Miami, but I'm wondering whether there is like an underlying Freudian desire here. Yeah, I would say about what you're actually doing and why you're doing it. And apart from that, I, I, I thought that um, one moment that gives me a bit of concern is that, for example, your Prix contamination is basically very close to the Deep Himmelblau project. It's basically a very similar idea. You take images from the Kopp Himmelblau archive and then you run it through a, a style gun or a cycle gun to create novel outcomes, yeah? which I think for them is totally legitimate. It's their work, it's their, it's their thing. They, they worked on this for the last 50 years and they're using that solid archive that they have to produce new things. Now, in your case, it's not your work, right? It's other people's work, right? I would rather say that maybe a next step would be increase the provocation. And instead of relying on the database of one specific office, really start to make mutations between them. So they become something like, like Minx or Prane. Yeah, so combinations of their names, it's either it's neither main noise it pricks, it's a combination of both of them and really create this mutant pricks main thing. Yeah, that, and what happens? Is it recognizable as a pricks anymore as a main? Is it something different that we don't, that we don't recognize? So thus it is maybe something new. We don't know. As long as we don't test it and try it, we don't know. But I think as a starting point to continue that sort of provocation, like, you know, does it create novel work? Does it not create novel work? Because for example, your results are very much readable to me as being a Copimulpro project or and, and even more in the Copimulpro things than in the Morphosis things, by the way, uh, which, which speaks actually to the unique sensibility that Wolf Briggs has, yeah? It means that certain features uh, come over and over again and appear in their projects, like specific angles maybe. That would be an interesting analysis, like create a neural network that analyzes why those features come over and over again in the results that you produce. That would be a scientific insight that would be interesting because it would analyze a specific sensibility of one specific person. Now, all of these apart, I think you did fantastic work. I think that the results are really beautiful. Now the question for me is rather like, how do you push it to be something that is Christopher Shannes instead of Pricks or Main? Yeah. All right. Thank you for your comments, uh, Matthias. Um, I, th I think definitely that that it that was a, a, also a point of concern for me is um, how how do I I put my own stamp 
um, instead of uh, making this just something that has already been done or can be done by anybody else. And um, I, I think I think the the ownership um, is is very interesting. And I think that um, in order to move forward with that, uh, I, I definitely have to do more research. Um, but I, I also would like to, um, you know, kind of create my own iterations. And um, obviously, uh, I mean, in, in all of architecture school, all of these great architects have always influenced my work. And um, I think what what I was trying to reach here with, with my goal is uh, not not being about my work, but um, kind of visualizing a place where I live and um, making it a place um, that I, I would love to live. And I think as a as an as an aspiring architect, um, I think we should we should. And I, I don't know if maybe the world wants it, but as an architect, um, I do love good architecture and. I would love for for every building to be good architecture and to, to provoke human beings. Um, so I, I guess that's where my kind of Freudian, uh, where where I I I want this control over Miami and I, I want it to be this or I want it to be that. Um, so so yeah. I, I just wanted to interrupt uh, very quickly. Um, I think Matthias brought up really good points, and I think he at some level adds with his experience, a level of complexity uh, that you can imagine. Um, uh, the word that came for me instead of mutation is speciation. Mm -hmm. Like basically you have different species of architects and then depending on how they breed in the system, they make new offspring, right? But ultimately um, the idea of, of coming to your own, how do you get there? I think that is research. How do you analyze and how do you get to those steps in the pipeline is research. I think Matthias and Daniel can talk about the science. Like what are the science hurdles that you have to overcome? What collaborations do you need? And I think for me um, in architecture, we're, verge, we're, we're going into the sciences very clearly to my guess, but how do you get back to the art and to the aesthetic? that is close to what you care for. So I, I think I go back to the original research. And if, if you think Miami is important, what about it? And then how does that scale to other places on the globe? I, I, I mean, I, I would always question though, whether we can not be contaminated. Um, uh, so in a sense like you know we, we the comment that adorna makes is that a human becomes human at all by um the fact that we imitate other people we, how do we exist in a bubble not not be influenced by other people in fact that's one of freud's, freud's comments that we're continually absorbing these impulses from outside um uh we, we need to move on fairly soon so uh, maybe just just, I'm going to just give a few comments. Sorry that I always have to give comments after you say that. <laughs> I think I'm just waiting too, uh, too, too long for, for saying something. Um, yeah, I, th I think, um, I mean, to put it very blunt, like I think uh, some architects are more successful than others on copying things, yeah? And those that are not successful, uh, we accuse them of copying things from other architects. The ones that are successful in masking things nicely, we, we never uh, catch them. And then we just claim that they are uh, better than the others. But I think uh, mostly what, this is what we are doing as architects. We always um, bring concepts from other uh, architects or ideas from other, uh, other architects. And we are trying in a way to reformulate those ideas in a way that it's uh, more uh, unique. Um, I think in, in your ca case, Christopher, I think um, just as, a, as an exercise and the way that you, you try to combine certain sort of things, I think it's uh, very interesting like um, to, to start to combine, like to compile a data set that is shared like different types of uh, buildings, not just one type. Yeah? So you have Coupion Blau in the same data set with, uh, with Miami downtown. And I think that's, that's an interesting, in a way, approach because um, there is not that much intervention from a, uh, from a designer. 
And now, of course, the results, uh, um, they might be in a way um, not the best in some instances, yeah, because probably uh, you don't really have that much control. And maybe that's a different discussion of how do you gain control and or not necessarily how do you gain control, but how do you um, curate in a way this data so that you have a correct, in a way, interpretation of, of, uh, of semantic features that you have in both, yeah. And uh, I think that that would be something next, yeah. Uh, for us at, uh, with DP and Blau, we have like, um, we draw a lot of inspiration from uh, style GANs, from cycle GANs, from other kinds of networks. And then we put together, you know, like this kind of uh, our own network to uh, to analyze the style of Coupillon Blau. And once you analyze the style, style of Coupillon Blau, then we, we go into this kind of phase of the machine in a way learning to, to output in a way new, new design. So, for us, it's always this kind of discussion of um, how can we control certain features that we have in our buildings? How can we uh, enhance and uh, or emphasize and de-emphasize certain features? Yeah, so like that in a way we really can uh, explore design in that kind of manner. So probably here also a, a future step in your in your research here would be that. Um, is there a way to um, to identify certain features, let's say, in um, in the buildings that I have in Miami versus uh, the features that I have in uh, Coupillon Blau or Domain, and then create a relation between those, yeah, and have the network translating in that kind of way, yeah. It should not be necessarily a cycle GAN kind of translation. Could be also this kind of style GAN kind of translation, but somehow those features they have to be controlled so that. There is a more, more, um, more clear in a way intentionality here, uh, because right now this is great. It's almost like this kind of like a, a more advanced type of collage, let's say, if we can say it. Um, it's it's mostly like combining, mixing everything together and creating nice in a way transitions. But uh, can there be a way where we have the semantic information learned? these kind of features learned and then specifically you know, I emphasize or say, okay, for this type of buildings in Miami, if you see this type of buildings, then you have this kind of features that have to be in a way learned or others. And also when it comes to that, I'm not talking about this kind of very top down in a way approach. Uh, I mean, I think we have to be very sensitive there because uh, you have to allow uh, a, a bit of fuzziness in a way to, to that kind of process so that the network has room in a way to uh, to move in a way. Yeah? And I think this is actually an interesting thing when it comes to, we have to understand the machines, the language that they speak and how they read things. Yeah, And then if we speak the same language then we can actually uh, encode correctly certain intentionality there without constraining in a way uh, that potential that the network can, uh, can offer us. Yeah, uh, So here, I, I, I think that those will be some some interesting steps, but I think uh, it's it's a great in a way approach. I understand that it's very difficult. Uh, many questions that are raised, I think they are valid. Um, but uh, I, personally, I really appreciate uh, trying in a way this kind of method and see okay, which is the potential of this. Now we see a certain potential of it. Now we see certain um, um, certain problems perhaps with this approach. And the next question will be how you move forward from here. Yeah? How do you improve then this kind of approach so that you bring in all these kind of concerns and uh, ideas that were discussed about in, in the review. Uh, but anyhow, uh, thank you very much for, for, uh, for this exercise. Um, thanks, Daniel. I, we, we're going to have to move on. This is unfortunate because I mean, look, these projects are really full of, they're very provocative and they, they're really opening up lots of kind of questions, um, and uh, um, but but just because of time constraints, we have to move on. So um, can I invite Maria to um, share her screen? Hello. Um, okay, give me one second. Okay, hopefully we can hear the sound in this. Let me know. 
goal test, and this is an exploration on the perception of color. Color Can you hear? Okay. Yes, yeah. Perception is unique, and it plays a vital role in the shaping of our realities and our individual developments. While color is powerful, it is also problematic. Not only is there an architectural phobia regarding colors, but there is also an inaccurate understanding of its use, so we limit the use of it and disregard it. For the most part, designers study and implement hues at a psychological level, focusing mainly on the emotions that colors have on individuals. Color is distinctive, which means each person's perception of color is completely different from one's own. Architects mostly eliminate color to express form and textures. But the real question is, what are we hiding or exposing by adding or subtracting color? The feeling of sensation plays a great role in color, but we need to look deeply to really grasp this and ask ourselves, what is the role? And how has architects' relationship to color affected our understanding of the world? Here we have a style dance interpolated video of Grand Canyon generated images that I began to explore with at the beginning of the semester. The beautiful natural curves and the abundance of similar hues captivated and activated my sensations. In the moment, I began to realize that those who have color vision deficiency would have a completely different experience than I was having. I filtered the images to black and white and began to see things such as patterns, rhythms, differences, tones, shades, movements, and more, and wondered if the world was almost like a paint by number kit. This is when I asked Annual Seth, are we painting the world? According to him, yes and no. Color is an interpretation that we are projecting onto the world. There are no colors out there. The world is colorless, odorless, and soundless. This led me to investigate how we paint the world in hopes to reveal a new approach towards questioning our design. In order to even recreate the world we live in, we would need particles to exist first before they can react with each other. Everything in the universe works with vibrations, frequencies, and energy. The sun, earth, and humans have a magnetic field allowing us all to work simultaneously to survive. The magnetic field of earth is caused by currents of electricity that flow in the molten core while the earth rotates. The powerful magnetic field passes out through the core of the earth, through the crust, and enters space. Without light, we have darkness. Light is a type of energy known as an electromagnetic radiation. The sun emits solar winds which can also be called solar radiation or electromagnetic waves. These waves are made up of, light, of tiny little packets of energy called photons. While light contains all visible web wavelengths, different wavelengths get diffracted differently. When we say something has color, what we actually mean is that light of a particular range of wavelengths is reflect, reflected more strongly than the light of other wavelengths. Longer wavelengths is shorter frequency and shorter energy while shorter wavelength is a higher frequency and a higher energy. Electromagnetic radiation consists of electromagnetic waves which are oscillating in the electromagnetic fields. Matter is any substance that has mass and takes up space. It exists as a solid, liquid, or gas. In this case, we have the Grand Canyon, which is made up of elements that can be found in the periodic table. Molecules are created which are made up of atoms, and these atoms are made up of neutrons, electrons, and protons, which are made up of quarks. We've established that photons are particles of light absorbed or emitted by molecules. When light hits the Grand Canyon, it absorbs photons and its energies, exciting the atoms and moving the electrons to a higher energy level. The movement of an electron from a high to low energy level and vice versa is called transition. The larger the transition between energy levels, the more energy is absorbed or emitted. During this process, the atoms are rotating and vibrating just like the universe. The energy transitions for the electrons of each element are unique and very distinct from each other. By identifying the colors of light emitted by a particular atom, we can identify that element based upon its emission spectrum. When light hits matter, Different phenomena can happen, such as reflection, absorption, refraction, scattering, or transmitted. Here we see reflection and absorption. The appearance of a color will be different depending on the time of the day, light, weather, and so on. In this case, colors being reflected enter our eyes, and thanks to our photoreceptor cells in our retinas, they are able to transfer signals to our brains 
in order for us to see color. These cells are categorized into rods and cones. Rods are concentrated around the edge of the retina and transfer mostly black and white information. Cones transmit the higher levels of light intensity that create the sensations of color and visual sharpness. The cones have a max sensitivity in the blue, green, red regions of the spectrum. These cells working in combination with connecting nerve cells give the brain enough information to interpret and name colors. Sometimes one or more than these cones do not function and are damaged affecting the perception of color causing a color vision deficiency. Here you can see different types of deficiencies when a certain type of cone is missing. Billions of years ago, the Vishnu Mountains were flattened to create the Vishnu Basement Rocks. 500 million years ago, the Cambrian Sea was at sea level, but due to the tectonic plates underneath, it moved above sea level, creating the Grand Canyon that we see today. The Grand Canyon has different types of rock layer formations and has up to 40 different types of rocks, including sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic rocks. Most of these rocks contain minerals, which are found on the periodic table, and some contain iron ores, which cause oxidation after years, giving the Grand Canyon the color that we see today. The perception of color and light is extremely vital to designers in helping us understand and interpret human beings and their relations with nature. Materiality is extremely important as it has a way of shaping our behaviors. Color exists for many reasons and can be used as a way of identifying, can be used as a survival mechanism, and it is a part of our evolution. Color wakes our cessation. And this exploration has led me to acknowledge the power that color and light have on our realities. Um, and that's my presentation. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Did you come to any conclusion about why architects don't use color so much? Is it? Um, well, I was thinking about it, um, and. I was thinking of my own uh, kind of wardrobe, which is we talked about before, which is uh, like black and white mostly. Um, and I see it as a way of uh, not standing out. Um, I don't like standing out. Uh, usually if I do want to stand out, I'll wear like red lipstick so it'll give me a pop. Um, and I think that like to show that like, I guess I'm, I can like, I guess shine. Um, without colors um, is why I don't use colors, um, which is, I guess, why architects don't use as much colors when designing um, because they want to see the forms and the textures. Um, I guess that's how I see it. <laughs> but you could also say you stand out because you're wearing black. I mean, certainly my but, family always gives me a tough time for wearing black. <laughs> yeah, that is true as well. Um, I, I, um, I saw it as a way of, um, Kind of, it was a way kind of camouflaging um, though. Be, I went to TJ Maxx and I saw a bunch of ladies like, wearing these colorful dresses and they were all popping out. Um, and I guess in a way I was popping out because I wasn't wearing colors, which is interesting. Um, so yeah. Maybe I can, um, so Maria, I really appreciate your um, sort of in-depth investigation into understanding the light and like really what, what is happening that we see the light and colors. And, and um, I felt like it was beginning of a video essay that could take on a completely new journey. Um, to that extent, I wonder if a sort of use of this a sort of style GAN deep learning algorithm was or is the proper way to address the, the issues that you're trying to get. I mean, maybe it's a beginning, um, but I personally would have said like, it would have been really interesting to actually explore materials that they change uh, their properties depending on how the light refract in a certain directions. Um, the materials that like a soap um, a film that changes color and it has this iridescence color that it gives you different color perception depending on which angles you're looking at or materials that literally have the thermochromic um, uh, properties that change color based on the temperature of their environment. So I see that as I see what 
you're getting at as like a beginning that has so much potential. And I really encourage you to actually get into exploring different crystals, different materials that they actually have different uh, color and light property depending on um, the, their surrounding environments. Thank you so much for your comment, Benaz. Um, actually, you are right. When I first started doing these uh, style gans interpret relations is when I started to ask myself these questions and <clears throat> both things kind of like went apart and I had to find a way to kind of bring it back together um, for my understanding. Um, so I agree that this is only just a start um, and I'm hoping that I can move forward with this in the future. I appreciate it. Like that. I would have just very quickly, I would have been very interesting to see how, for instance, you could combine sort of iridescence, color changing crystals with Grand Canyon and then hallucinate and see like, what if the whole Grand Canyon was co constantly color changing? Um, that would have been very interesting, <laughs> mm -hmm. but thank you. Maybe just a quick side comment about what Benaz mentioned with iridescence and coloration. The funny thing is actually that at least in nature, iridescence works differently than what Maria presented in how we perceive color. I mean, the, uh, the reflection of sunlight to a, to a specific object and the object absorbs a specific spectrum and then the rest is reflected into our eyes is one way of getting color. Iridescence in nature, like for example, in butterfly wings is created through geometry, not absorption, which is kind of a really interesting different way of creating color in that it doesn't use pig, a pigment, but it uses geometry to create coloration. So there's like, it's a completely side, different side story. It's nothing to do with style guns or anything, but Beautiful, very, very elusive, very, uh, I think it's, your video has almost like a hyp hypnotic quality to it. You get drawn into it, yeah, which I think is maybe goes into what Benaz was saying in terms of storytelling with video, which I think is a really great point. Um, I don't know if I can add anything constructive here more than what you showed. I think it's a beautiful, I, and I, I would just gonna use Benaz's term. It's a beautiful video essay about color. And maybe just also quick about the aversion of architects to color, which I think is an interesting problem. That's not, it's it not, it's it has not been like that forever. It's rather a new phenomenon. And with new, I, I mean like 250 years, something like that, uh, which basically is uh, Johannes Winkelmann, who was an art historian in Rome, that said that like all classical figures are white uh, because all they were marble and white and so on. So he defined that anything classical and elegant has to be just one color, which is white. And that actually spread through architecture over the last 200 something years, proponed, of course, by people like Le Corbusier and, and, and Mies, who were like, you know, purists in terms of color and so on. And of course, because of the notion that it, it becomes neutral, it gives architecture a longer lease on life, which I'm not entirely sure if it's true, but it's the general notion at the moment, I guess. And then there were other periods in time where the famous polychromic wars happened, like in the 1820s, 1830s, where architects and scientists were arguing around that, you know, antiquity was not white, it was actually pretty colorful. And there was an argument to introduce color in architecture, for example, by people like Gottfried Semper, who made a whole, whole argument about that. So there's like a whole interesting history about the relationship of architecture to color within the last like, let's say in modernity, very generously speaking, yeah, and how and the, and the question whether we have to perpetuate that or we have to, you know, find another way of incorporating that. And, and I'm very thankful about your contribution. I think it's really interesting to discuss these things. I would love to discuss this further, but I guess there's other people who would like to comment to your fantastic project, Maria. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Matthias. Maria, I, I had something quick. I put two references um, in the chat, but one is uh, The Evolution of Beauty by Prum. And um, it's about birds, but basically it's also about behavior, color, and uh, what is beauty, aesthetics, and nature, and how birds evolved into different species. So just to keep in mind with color. And then the next thing is uh, Vilcek. Uh, he was, I think he won the Nobel Prize in physics. And, um, but it's, uh, his, his book is called A Beautiful Question. And he goes down to the atomic uh, level. And what is light? So a lot of his discoveries are about light and how light can change, how it embeds or encodes 
information, how it encodes data, and then how it can be reinterpreted in different domains uh, to the material level, right? So I, uh, when I uh, viewed your, uh, when I saw your essay, I thought about, uh, you know, do we really, are we really seeing, uh, what are we really seeing? So I guess a philosophical question, but the next thing is what do we really know? And these two books give you an insight, deep insight on a biological understanding of color and form. And the other is a physics, like a very fundamental base research and knowledge of what we really understand as a totality of the universe. So just to offer those two provocative uh, bodies of research. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's actually really interesting because like, yeah, color has been a around my whole life, but no one, I never really thought, okay, well, how am I perceiving color? And my first questions were, okay, well, what is our reality? Is it 2D? Is it literally just lines? And that's why I was like, are we painting by number? Is, is this really what it is? But um, I'm glad I went into this exploration because as an architect, you know, I took color theory, we're taught to use colors for, you know, um, our um, uh, ooh, emotions, um, but it's deeper than that. Um, so this is why I went into this. Um, I appreciate your comments. Uh, thank you. I, I just, I, I don't know whether we, we've got maybe one more type of one more comment to move on. We're already reaching the end. Um, I don't know whether Elite might like to comment as, a, as an artist. Um, uh, with a, some an architect with a, an architect stroke artist, uh, um, you're muted. Yeah. Um, no, I've just been enjoying the conversation. It's been I'm just learning so much being here. But uh, it's interesting because uh, it's something that, uh, as our collaborative, we think about a lot in terms of the aesthetics of a thing as a way of communicating ideas as a way and and I think a lot of artists think about it also as a way to kind of like um to shape the politics of certain dynamics in a in a kind of in a, a surreptitious way without like appealing through parts of the brain that or that not appealing through the logic but through other 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 parts, but it's interesting here to, um, in terms of the, um, I, I guess I'm shifting the conversation, but it's interesting to hear some of the critique that is bringing it back to the semantics of how you are thinking about, um, it, in, about, about uh, computation and, and, and the scripts that you're writing. So I, I think that's, I, I actually am gonna be taking that back and trying to reevaluate how we're thinking about aesthetics as a tool to communicate, but also kind of re, rethinking the, the semantic portion about it. Like what, what, are, what, what is kind of our underlying algorithm or our underlying scripts for how we're seeing, um, uh, I mean, we're, we think of aesthetics as a strategy in a sense, uh, and there still has to be that semantic kind of uh, underpinning uh, that that's kind of, I don't know that I'm speaking clearly at all. <laughs> I've just been in like listening mode, absorption mode, but it just, it's bringing back that relationship between the aesthetics and the semantics and what you're actually using these scripts for. Like, what is your purpose? What's the purpose of them? Or what are you hoping to communicate? So yeah, I really appreciate um, your presentation. And, and, and like previously commented the format of it as a visual essay, um, I have a, a friend that teaches at RISD and a lot of his students um, in the graphic design department have been have been shifting their presentations into these visual uh, video formats as a way of, of, you know, communicating the work and performing the work. Um, thank you so much. Uh, one last comment is um, actually this whole process has been a little uh, difficult just because I'm a, we're mostly all visual people. And when I was trying to understand this abundance of information and how we perceive color, I was having a really rough time. So I had to go back 
and illustrate all the words and everything that I have shown today to really grasp it. Um, so yes, I agree with you. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, it's, Maria, I just want to thank you for this presentation. I thought it was really thought provoking. And I think one thing that, that uh, has come out of the studio is that actually it, it's not a studio where we've kind of like we're just polishing things and saying that's it. We've finished. We've all finished our, our, our architecture education. Uh, I, we've, we've resolved it and it's and here it is. It's the opposite. In other words, that I think a lot of a lot of uh, uh, so far, all the presentations have really posed more questions than they've answered. And have, have established a kind of research project that could go on for, for for some time to come. And I think that you've you've really raised some some interesting, important questions. And which I mean, I I'm not even sure the answer is. I'm still I'm still I'm still left with this question: Why color? I, one thing I would kind of like maybe as a provocation sort of put in there, I mean, one of the comments has been made that, that is that is blue as a color was only recognized or appreciated as a separate color relatively recently, you know, and, and once you see it, you see it, right? And in, in different cultures, you have like the Eskimos, they can see different sort of types of, of, of snow and they get to recognize it. And, 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 and in England, we have different forms of gray, right? I mean, or different clouds. You go to the, the weather forecast, they get, they were like 25 different cloud ver versions that you don't have in California for example and I'm just wondering whether the opposite happens in architecture at some point we kind of get trained out of thinking in terms of color which could be a, a very negative thing so but I, I you know this is a, this is wonderful research and I just I think this is the, not the end but the beginning so congratulations thank you um one last thing I had it was just a comment I was thinking about it the other day was what if um we weren't um it wasn't in our evolution to perceive color and say that because we kept talking about England and London being like this kind of dark grayish um, environment. What if our whole world was that environment? Everyone experienced that. And then all of a sudden, a, like the next day we have like colors and light and we see sun and we see the blue. How would that impact us uh, from being in this kind of uh, Londonish grayish world um, to then now seeing color? How would that kind of like mess with us um and i thought it was just an interesting like thought i had while uh finishing my project uh but that's my last comment uh thank you <laughs> yeah but really just to kind of just a one final comment to follow up from that and that's to say that you know i think we can also think about how different species see see color or see see things and i mean the comment was made at a presentation yesterday that he does that that you know, basically that uh, that that different animals have a different range of smell we uh, and hearing i mean we know that dogs have got a far greater range of smell and hearing that we have now the interesting creature is the chameleon that has of course you know no smell and no no hearing at all and yet the most sophisticated visual apparatus and uses color as a kind of defensive mechanism or, or a survival mechanism shall we say uh, my suspicion is that color is some kind of survival mechanism and that we're closer to the, the the chameleon in terms of the, the of the spectrum of animals than we are to the dog but 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 i, I you know this this is an absolutely fascinating presentation because you really opened up all those questions fabulous uh, let's let's move on to our final uh, presentation before the break um we've actually reached the time of the break already so we're running a bit late very late um uh, philip and, and maita um you'd like to share your screen Alrighty, everyone. Um, I guess first, let's check to make sure that everyone can see the screen. Yes. Alrighty. Okay. So, uh, welcome to Organism. Um, it's a brief visual experience of which may be taking place in the not too distant future. Next page, my day. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God. Gotta love technology, huh, guys? Um, well, I guess I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Philip, uh, my and my partner Maite. We're uh, we are the collaborators in this project. Uh, including one more uh, with the use of artificial intelligence. You can pass on to the next slide, Maite. 
uh, I wanted to add a, a, a quote I enjoyed from a, a more recent sci-fi film. Uh, it wasn't destroying, it was changing everything. It was making something new. Uh, and with that, we'll, we'll uh, begin our experience. So um, regarding our experience, it was very exciting for Maite and I, uh, well, us as a pair of more traditional architect students to immerse ourselves in the collaboration with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and interrogating this process, which is soon to envelop our profession. Okay, on that note, thanks to our professor, we were able to learn in, uh, we were able to uh, collaborate with this new inorganic collaborator who is unbiased, will not reject any input or adhere to any architectural rules. So to guide the design process uh, and the result was a brand new world with forms unrecognizable with no immediate architectural logic, which invokes feelings, all of which may not be too positive, however, very new and exciting. Our process began with various trials consisting of combinations between various data sets and the application of different GANs networks, uh, hoping to find at this, uh, an instance geometry or logic which we could abstract and then apply it to our new architecture. This process was quite difficult. Uh, it required a lot of time and manipulation of the data sets. And after a few weeks, uh, a few weeks of alterations, we noticed that the results uh, that we desire will not be achieved with uh, how we were presenting the data to the networks. So we took a step back and adjusted what we presented entirely. As you can see with some adjustments to the data sets, we, we, be, we began to see moments which uh, proved interesting. Uh, however, it was too recognizable. Uh, we could still read, read it logically as architecture and the GANs understood the logic of buildings presented and adhered um, to some logic were in manipulation of court. At this moment, we decided that the data set was still incomplete um, or perhaps incorrect if we wanted the if we wanted to achieve a new morphology we would need to dismiss uh, current notions and understanding of what is architecture and ensure that our network understand this um, it was at that moment when uh, we began researching and and researching what details we could use that represents Miami that isn't necessarily architecture So the result, it was uh, the combination of data uh, not representing buildings or architecture, but kinetic movement, uh, like launching of spaceships and instances of, coral, of corals and fungi, uh, moments of aviation landing or lifting off from airports um, to beach, beach critters like crabs um, to even cups of espresso. So thanks to the disorganization of materials references, with extraneous tinkering, with, with coats and coffee of our own, Gans was able to recognize these components to give birth to new alien morphologies. At last, uh, we arrive at a point in our collaboration where the results are more than satis satisfactory. Uh, within the few batches of our results, we discover moments that are very alien, yet very architectural. These structures each have varying characteristics. So once we were satisfied with our results, we began investigating ways to enhance the architecture. So in addition to a few more tests, we began to investigate image resolution upscaling. 
seeing our seats were at a smaller resolution, uh, maxed out at 512 by 512 pixels, we needed to supersize them to allow us to transform the images and represent them clearly. Artif artificial intelligence aided us again with the application of uh, image super resolution, a code which studies an image and upscales the image by multiplying and reproducing pixels to enhance the resolution. With this application, now we witness moments in these Promethean structures which exhibit an exoskeletal structure which appears to add support. Other moments now that uh, with stronger contrasting material properties, including possible moments of translucence. And then we have moments where we, rec where we may recognize these forms as if these aliens adapted to the environments they inhabit. And then questions such as, are they self-sustaining? As you can see here, the orientation, the structure with its translucent facade which appears to be feeding off solar energy. So we start to notice that each of these instances exhibit phenotypical influences. Adaptation to its environment, like all organisms which inhabit our planet, sometimes even displaying aggression when the environment appears to be harsh as if to protect itself. So we believe this process was extremely successful as our intent was to challenge our standard art understanding of architecture and creativity. And now for our final component in this experiment, we now take the reins of and control the rest of the design process, beginning to create moments in which these new organisms interact with us and one another. Providing glimpses into a possible future where these aliens will begin to appear and coexist with Earth. And that would conclude this presentation. I hope you enjoyed your brief adventure into the future. Thank you, um, Philip and uh, Maita. Questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Philip and Maita. This was super enjoyable. Um, really, really cool results. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, you didn't say so much, but just visually there's so much to unpack here. And, and I think that there's like so many relationships to certain methods of thinking through these kind of projects you think would be really helpful to, to talk through, I think. I mean, visually stunning, visually great, yeah. Um, that you're using the terms organisms in itself would be a longer conversation, but I would like to go into a specific direction, uh, which is I'm not entirely sure, but it seems to me the quote you used at the beginning, I'm not sure. I think it was from Color Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, I, I could be wrong, but it sounded very Lovecraftian in a way. And if you're talking about Lovecraft and the things you have creating here, they have definitely a Lovecraftian quality to them. They're strange, they're weird, they're, they're different, they're, but at the same time, they're familiar. And um, Graham Harmon wrote, wrote a couple of books that I like, not all of them, but a couple of them. And one of them, which I really like is his book on H.P. Lovecraft, which is called Weird Realism. And in that book, he takes some examples 
from Lovecraft's uh, writings and interprets them with aspects of defamiliar defamiliarization and estrangement, ruination. So there's a couple of terms here, which I think could apply very well to what you guys are trying to do here, like aspects of defamiliarization, for example. It means it's different to what we know, but in, there are features in there that we recognize. Yeah? Uh, the example from H.P. Lovecraft is, for example, a man meets his cousin and he looks exactly like he's always looked, so he recognizes his cousin. But the moment his cousin opens his mouth and speaks, the voice is demonic and weird and strange. So there's something strange going on here, right? We, he recognizes his cousin, but it's something different. And it's similar with the architecture you're creating here. We recognize features of it, like glass surfaces, steel, construction elements, and so on and so forth. So there's features we recognize as architectural elements, but they are put together in a really strange, weird way. And that makes it interesting and attractive and, 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 and discussable for us. It creates a, a point of discussion here. Uh, what, another point, which is really beautiful in your renderings is that, and this is something that happens always with this process, but nonetheless, we should point this out, is that your environment is also estranged, right? There's like, it's not only the piece of architecture in the middle, that is affected by the process, the process also affects the environment. And I, I really like those images where you, you show those environments as something that is different and strange. I, I'm not the biggest fans of the collage at the end where you try to normalize the situation, like put it into something that we can live with. It becomes a normal project, right? I don't think that's maybe the strongest part of your design thinking, but I definitely think that Along those lines of ideas of estrangement, defamiliarization, ruination, uh, thinking through the philosophy that comes around it, what, what is the realist position around that? Like, how do you analyze this in a more uh, realist way? Would allow to speculate around your project in a, in a really deep way. Uh, so your images are super inspiring. They're inspiring. They're definitely inspiring me to talk about H.P. Lovecraft. Other people might interpret them completely different, by the way. But uh, that's the beautiful thing about these results is that they allow, at least for the moment being, as long as we don't have like a solid theory about AI and architecture, to speculate around them. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you, and thank you for your comments. Uh, definitely a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft, so that was a, a blessing to hear. Uh, I did take inspirations from, from Lovecraft and uh, other iconic uh, sci-fi moments as well. The quote actually comes from the most the more recent movie, Annihilation. Uh, it's a sci-fi sci alien invasion movie. Uh, it's, it's, based, it's based quote, on an- But I do in love, yeah. It's based on an H.P. Lovecraft story. It's actually color out of space. I will look into that thing. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think Matthias, I think you're absolutely right. It, it's when they get tamed that they lose this kind of vital quality. And it kind of like, in a way, what I, what I think of the real potential is to kind of like, you know, estrange things, you know, to deep familiarize things. And, you know, in a way, almost like Tarkovsky does with his movie, whereby the, the very familiar becomes defamiliarized in a way. And, uh, so I, I, I think the ones that are less kind of controlled and contained, I mean, this one here is a little bit too, too controlled, but to, to ramp up the weirdness and, 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 and you know, the, what is that? You know, and I think, um, I know, so, certainly on the beach here, sometimes I see some really strange creatures that um, are washed up on the shore and you're looking at these things and saying, what the hell? And I think, you know, therefore, you want to ramp, I would ramp up that. I'd ramp up the what the hell side of thing rather than try and make them immediately discernible and, and objectified in a, on a familiar landscape. Um, yeah. I, can, I was just going to jump in here as a, to defend the familiar landscape just for, just for a moment. I was just thinking about the only person that we saw in your renderings, like the, uh, the person who was in the, in, I think it was the, uh, the Mies Pavilion, um, the Barcelona Pavilion. And I was just going to say that there's a there's something to be said for or even that like the kid this kid I, I didn't know whether he was I like this image because I don't know his expression and he's kind of like in the shadows quivering like maybe these things are moving but I think there's an empathy that builds when you show a context for these um, things and I'm I'm thinking you know I was recently um, thinking about Michael Sorkin and his passing and Michael Sorkin was a huge influence on my work and. And just how, from from Sorkin's perspective, the weird was the political, and the political involved people, and the people, we are what make things weird. I mean, nature itself does what it's going to do, and we find things on the beach that 
have no, you know, no intention on being any, any weirder than they have to be to evolve and to survive. So in a sense, it's all about us and all about where we stand in these environments and, and where we sit or where we position ourselves. And I love that about these, um, about, about that aspect of the possibility. Now, when they become too normal and like this is every day, then I totally get it. But I think that, that if we can understand the, the political behind this, um, this kind of these new morphologies and, and what they imply about who we are and what we value. I think that's another possible direction that this could take. So thank you guys. It was a, a really interesting work. Yeah, maybe I could just chip in something that the, 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 the notion of the kind of uncanny um, is kind of interesting from this perspective because uh, and it's something that, that the artist Thomas Demand um, uh, works on where he kind of he does a, re a reproduction of a very familiar image. He builds these things up with 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 glue and, and cardboard, unbelievably elaborate sort of things. But the point is that they're, they're almost the same, but not quite. And and, they, and and that's the uncanny quality that is disturbing in some senses. And I, if you think about the way that sort of the replication is used at a very political level. I mean, like a cartoon, for example, you, the cartoon is kind of a, an imitation of someone, but it's slightly different and you're giving it a political twist. It's that edge that, that, that kind of makes it sort of kind of uncanny. That's why I like this one. I agree with this particular image. It's going to it's a very familiar environment. We know it's Mises, Barcelona Pavilion. But what the hell is that on the land on the horizon? I think that's the it's that play of what of the familiar and the unfamiliar that Riggs is really really extraordinary but you the thing is they're not fully disclosed you could you know you almost want to to look around the corner and see if you can see more about what these weird things are but it's it's there, there, there's i think you you guys and your most most successful ones you're tapping into something that is really 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 powerful uh, and the less successful ones you're kind of normalizing it and, and making it kind of too straightforward but i it's got huge potential for sure I do appreciate all the comments and uh, thank you for the defense, uh, Professor Stewart. I don't know if the elite would like to say anything from a kind of artistic perspective. Elite, you better turn up your video if you don't want to be called on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I, it's, it's, it's exactly, I think I agree with all the comments. It's, it, in terms of where you amp up the, the weirdness and what it is that you're trying to say. And um, it, it, that weirdness is, is, is a really powerful thing though. I mean, if, if there is something that you're trying to, to get across or to evoke, it really does communicate to some other part of your brain or your, or your emotion that, that can, I don't know, that can really um, connect to people in ways that, uh, that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So I, I, I agree with you to, to, to kind of amping, amping up that strangeness is interesting, but, but the same thing that, that uh, John is saying to recognize that actually we're the strangest ones of all. And, and that, um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I mean the, the, the I mean I, I, John of course knows Bernard Shumi very well, and one of his kind of like uh, his one of his strategies is tech, techniques of defamiliarization. I think that's what, in a sense, all of his kind of early deconstructivist work was kind of based on. The real challenge comes is when they become familiar. Once you kind of that quaint old distorted deconstructivist building becomes part of your your language. I mean, he, he deliberately. I mean, he speak he speaks about the kind of the, 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 all we got left is the shock, and he really plays on the shock as a strategy, and it, it is it is very effective. But how long does the shock last? That would be the question. Yeah, and there's also these meditative exercises where you are trying to uh, see expand, you know, see where you name things other than what they are in order to try to see them as some, something different, whether it's the trees or the road or the thing that you're walking on so that you kind of experience 
the that moment and that place and that presence in a completely different way. So, you know, there there is there's definitely something powerful about trying to um, transmute the and kind of maybe you're uncovering the condition that we're in, you know, by kind of transmuting it or translating it into this this other kind of strangeness. So. Uh, Neil, I have a quick comment, and I know that you are concerned about time, but um, I would just add that I think it's a great uh, exploration, and my comment is that it, it could have been also um, in interesting to see other uh, types of data sets to create these alien uh, structures, um, very futuristic, and also maybe another exploration is what if the whole... Um, city or Miami or whatever we see here is actually a very futuristic rather than certain objects here and there. Um, it seems that there is um, the process of selecting those data sets that uh, uh, Philippe and Maiti started with was a little bit still kind of um, based on their preference. And I wonder with all of the AI uh, experimentation and this happens also with my students is that they always have their own uh, kind of um, criteria to select successful data sets. And I'm not sure if this criteria always is actually um, objective or, or um, the data set curation is actually uh, envisioned uh, upfront to lead to something rather than they just like it. <laughs> and I think, um, I mean, I, I really agree with all of the comments and I like the results, but I was wondering what other, what other criteria uh, for uh, the data set can lead to um, alien environments or future environments that are different from the sci-fi movies that we see. Maybe something actually more promising rather than this kind of usually post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's my main comment, thank you. Gustavo. Uh, thank you, I, I wanted to uh, thank you, you guys for your project. I had, uh, I guess, um, maybe just a, a thought like uh, there's an idea of, uh, and maybe Banas can talk about this more, uh, the idea of world making and the idea of uh, virtuality and what you're trying to, what is a purpose? So if it's the alien, then what type of alien world are we talking about? There is Aliens the movie, uh, and there is a certain type of aesthetic and a logic. And uh, there's also a logic of different um, universes of narratives. So maybe something that you can think about is, you know, what type of narratives uh, can your data set, like basically whatever you're feeding to this data set, make? And I think that um, for maybe a speculative narrative, it might be another line of research because uh, there is maybe the AI in creating of narrative, so you can collaborate with uh, the AI, but there's also, your own speculative narrative. How much can your imagination go and be free? So maybe if you're working on those edges, that could be a great way for you to make maybe a, a, a comforting AI <laughs> slash future versus a more, um, I'm not gonna have a moments of rest future. Uh, so, and maybe instead of thinking about humans, maybe it's a world of insects or a new species too. So I would say just have fun with it. But what I see so far is really great and cool. And I wanted to thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Just to maybe throw one, one final final comment in there, but um, well, less than else has something to say. Uh, it, what is I find interesting is 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 the contrast of of uh, well, the, the the model of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which to, uh, had a huge impact on me personally, my upbringing, because it was it was it happened in the UK and it was kind of I don't know. Um, but what was interesting about it was it was about I don't know if you know this, but it was about this character Arthur Dent, who is absolutely normal in a sense. He's kind of shown in the movie in his kind of pajamas and, and dressing gown, you know. And they find out that the one way to kind of survive when there's an apocalyptic moment about to happen is to go to the pub and get a pint of beer and two and two packs of crisps. But the most common everyday thing, but somehow it's made this distorted and it's defamiliarized. So the familiarized did defamiliarize. 
was was in many ways was extraordinary. The other day I was I was listening to I was eavesdropping on Clubhouse <clears throat> with um, Elon Musk, and he said that this was the most important um, philosophical piece for him ever. You know, the whole thing. And I don't know if you've seen the Tesla uh, car going out into space, the most weird, defamiliarized thing, but it has the kind of expression don't panic on the, on, on the dashboard, which is obviously an evocation of this particular thing. And then I think what's happening now in terms of what, what's happening with monkeys and God knows what else with Elon Musk is, is, is particularly kind of weird, but it, it comes out of the, through the lens of this kind of defamiliarization of the familiar, which I think is a very powerful tool. And, and just, just to comment on Gustavo and, um, and Shermin's point about the criteria that you're using. And I, that, 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 that criteria kind of can be the narrative or part re related to it. So the, this thing about a speculative kind of uh, set of set of ideas or whether you make a, a city that's pro bird or whatever these things are that, that that's really, it seems like where the real power of the, of the thing lies and where I think the surprise could come from and, and kind of delight of what comes from that, that really, that emerges, that you, that, that you wouldn't anticipate. Maybe we can leave the final comment to Marina. Um, first of all, thank you, Marina, for everything this semester, it's been fabulous, thank you. No, thank, thank you all of you for, for, for your comments and um, it made me really think about all the production that we'll be working on with the, with the students because finally they are the center of this production. They, they are their own, uh, you know, uh, narratives and uh, interests what are put in here and what we saw and uh, I believe this is, it was a really great experience and your, your comments, it made me think a lot of things that we were talking with Neil during the classes as well in terms of, for example, I have like um, one thing I can mm -hmm. see about the, the comments is that they, they are like super different. And maybe that's why, maybe that's also because the proposals are super different between them. There are a lot of differences that you can map in the in the older production. And that's because there is uh, the, the students were may um, mm -hmm. uh, in a way proposing what they wanted to, to work. And uh, w one thing I can say is like, we were this one thing I were thinking about what you say is like finally where are the references for architects to work? You know, where, where are our archives <laughs> in a certain way? And what, how we use them to, 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 to project. And I believe in this case is, is related with this um, uh, uh, comment of uh, Shermin in terms of how we uh, in a way um, create, create our uh, data in terms to produce something and how we in a way drive these uh, references and how uh, in a way this production can uh, open or, or make our repertoire even broader and even show us things that we were never could imagine in a way and uh, using for architectural design not only in terms of inspiration also in terms to discover like new logics be behind them. Uh, so that's one comment, and uh, I believe that this is also related with the first um, and the first presentation of Mateus when he was working with his memories. But finally, he was projecting new things with it. So uh, I believe that that's really interesting as well. And there is the other discussion about this kind of architectural species and how they mutate between them. No? Then you have the the work of uh, Chris and the, this work that we are talking about now of uh, Philippa Maite in terms of kind of hybridization or how we architects manipulate our data set in order to uh, produce new architectural, mm -hmm. um, uh, it could be building objects or even processes uh, that are appearing here. And that's another thing that, that I was thinking about your, 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 um, your comments. I believe that uh, Matthias' co uh, comments about the provocations are really great because there, there were a lot of provocation in terms of finally, what is the, I mean, wh who, uh, who is contaminated and who is contaminate, contaminated finally, you know, because we are all contaminated by the star system because we were studying this architecture all the time, also in terms of colors when uh, Maria um, was talking about why architects we don't, don't like colors. I'm wearing black, <laughs> for example, me as well. And maybe this is, uh, uh, I was thinking about how 
uh, the way we receive uh, uh, architecture in terms of, for example, publications and so on. There was like very, a lot of publications which are black and white pictures. So maybe we understand architecture through this representation sometimes and then can in a way influentiate the way we think architecture as well. And uh, there is also the, to, just to relate with Maria, um, uh, in a way work that I believe that in certain ways is related with Nico's work in terms to decode something and try to go in deep like in terms of what Benas was saying in terms to go like really deep in the in the in the code and this I believe that uh, in a way was related with a text that we were talking during the class uh Manuel de Landa text about um the the expressivity the material expressivity and he was talking about the codes and how we decode colors and I believe that that is related with the comment of elite in terms of uh, this idea that uh, semantics in terms of, and that can also be related with Benas in terms of how uh, uh, the style guide uh, exercise or experimentation was related with the, with the, the, the this um, in a way understanding uh, of the color through the code. And then I believe that there are like certain logic that could be explored as well. I mean, it, it made me think a lot about what you, what you comment, but uh, it was like really great comments and more in Nico's work, which is, is incredible in terms to finally he, I agree with uh, Daniel in terms that he is uh, in a way designing his own tool in a way, no? And we architects, even with the reference that we, the way that we talk with, we work with references as well, we are all the time trying to design our own machine to design. So I believe that in that way, it, uh, I try to put all the comments together. I, sometimes I forgot some of them, uh, but uh, I really appreciate uh, all, all, all the comments. More uh, uh, Sean Stewart, I, I, I mean, with, yesterday was Sean, so I don't want to talk too much about his comment, but I believe that also how um, uh, Miami in terms of uh, also a reference, because some more of the students are in Miami and they are trying to use in this uh, in a way, database or reference as well in terms of context. So I, I, I really appreciate all, all your comments. So thank you. Uh, we did take a, a break now for half an hour so people can get a rest and get some food and whatever. I just want to thank all the jurors for this session. We're going to switch off and we're going to switch back on again in, uh, in well, 23 minutes time. But um, uh, thank you so much. I want to thank Ahmed um, uh, in Egypt and Manos in, in, in Greece and and, and 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 everyone around the world it's been uh, quite an incredible thing um yes um uh, uh and so we'll meet again um well it's gonna be due to we should have we're due to meet again at, at 12 est if that means anything to you um uh, which is 23 minutes time so um we will we'll do that and we have to keep keep going because we've got to finish by four o'clock for the um for the next step for the Super jury. So thank you everyone for the presentations. Lots of interesting questions being raised um, and we'll meet again at, uh, at one o'clock. Thank you.
Thanks, Piana. Thank you. So um, we need to start going again. For some reason, I can't start my video. <laughs> um, uh, Piana, could you let me start my video? I, I don't, could you make me a co-host or something? I'm the host. Okay. <clears throat> oh, great. Thank you. So, um, let, we need to to start again. Um, I uh, hope that Manos and um, other colleagues are able to join. Um, Um, Andre, so um, you're the next on. Let's just give it uh, a minute or so before um, Ahmed's still here. I don't know what time it is in Egypt, but thank you for being there. It's still Ahmed. Um, we've lost a few of our jurors, um, uh, Emmanuel Co and uh, Costas. It's way beyond midnight for them. Um, so. Uh, um, but anyway, okay. So, um, Andre, let's 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 get going because I'm I'm conscious of the fact we have to finish in uh, at four o'clock in order to move on, and um, the discussion has uh, is not getting t any shorter; it's getting getting bigger. But, uh, you know. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see my presentation? Yeah. Let me just uh, quickly uh, welcome Aya Riyad, um, who's joining us from uh, Dubai. Um, Aya is an AADRL graduate. Um, she's part of the Digital Futures Organization now, and um, she's teaching at the American University of Cairo. So it's great that we're straddling the, the globe, as it were. Welcome, Aya. Hi, Neil. Thank you so much for this introduction. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. It's great to have you here. Thank you. All right. Shall I start? Yes. All right. Great. So first and foremost, I want to thank uh, everybody for being here. My name is Sandra Conrado, and I'll be taking you through my thesis explorations. As Anu Sai stated, we live in a constant hallucination. Our brain is actively collecting data from our environment and creating predictive perceptions of what it is that we're experiencing. In this interesting cycle, it can be said that we are constantly hallucinating our realities. One of my favorite artists, Salvador Dalí constantly dove deeper into his own hallucinations through the use of his paranoid critical method. In this process, he would attempt to rationalize the rational elements of his subconscious mind through his art and literature. In this diagram, we can observe perhaps the workings of the paranoid critical method, starting by that ephemeral hallucination, which is then processed by Dalí's creative mind to then be concretized in his artwork. For this part of my thesis, I wanted to revert this process 
and take the already created artwork by Dali and process it through the creative process of an AI to see if we could perhaps revert back to that ephemeral hallucination. So in order to do that, I created a data set of over 600 Dali painting variations to train the generative adversarial networks to produce new Dalian paintings. The results are quite convincing. Uh, they look like they could perhaps be that ephemeral, paranoid Dalian hallucination. However, I also wanted to dive into what affects our consciousness and the way that we perceive the world and that is ultimately our environment. In the case of Dali, he lived and moved around a lot between Catalonia, New York, and even Paris. So taking this into consideration, I took the already trained generative networks that were creating these new Dalian images and fed it a new architectural data set to see if perhaps Dali could be an architect. And if so, what would his architecture look like through this lens of AI. The results I got were incredibly interesting considering that Dali had predicted that in the future architecture would be soft and furry. In this images, we perhaps see an abstraction of it, this idea with a distinguishable structure. These results also show us some interesting in iterations, showing some facade and perhaps in its own way, a prionoric critical architecture. However, I did not want these images to solely live on a 2D plane. So an interesting thing that happened during COVID is that Google Collaborative Arts opened up virtual museums that already exist. For example, this one in Sao Paulo by Lina Bobardi for people to actively go in and virtually look at the artwork. So in the purpose of not letting the images I created live merely on a 2D realm, I instead proposed to create a VR gallery experience to showcase the work. The gallery consists of four different realms interconnected by a series of portals inspired by Dali's primary critical process. However, it must be stated blatantly that by no means do I attempt to create or even interpret the work of Dali because that would inevitably lead to catastrophic failure. Instead, I propose a work of my own genius to dive into my own paranoid critical process to create an experience that will make Dali turn in his grave. And so with further ado, I'll let you do it. Rejoice. For this first gallery, we indulge in a yet familiar setting within natural bounds of impossible possibilities. That of the infinite and of self embodied by a series of mirrors working effortlessly to fully absorb you into this playing field, where we can completely detach our mundane minds, bodies, and souls to assume a more savory and tempting new identity, characterized by a striking glow only possible in a world not tied to any reality. Lucky you. Now, as we continue to step deeper into the mystic ether of my paranoid critical disembowelment, there's absolutely no reason for me to continue to assume any facets of my atomic self. Instead, now I shall be the opposite, and let you into the secret creation of my own religion, one which would be at once sadistic, masochistic, and paranoid. In my church, a succession of wonders will abandon all repulsive formative norms of banal rituals. Instead, we shall cherish our savior, the generative networks, as the highest palpable deity framed by these worshiping shrines. After we rid all importance of humans, could we then be spoken of as artists? if the archangelical AI is producing all glorified images? And if so, what does the construct of anguish between space and time, psychological gods and tragic agitations tell us of this reality? Do I believe? 
I have faith. But I don't believe. If I believe, then everything would be solved. Even the problem of death. Looking deeper into our very own terrestrial lives, however, we can discover the marvelous chance that we have of becoming immortal. In this stage, we can then stroll fluidly between life and death to observe the vague mechanical materialism of our realities, deconstructed through a single portal. No one so often has perished. No one so often has been reborn. In this waltz of the phoenix, the absolute source of power, the brain, continues to live in its super gelatinous and eternal intestinal glory. And speaking of glory and rotund delineum apotheosis, we can all agree that one thing the world can never have enough of is the outrageous. We can therefore only define surrealism as Dali. May this serve as a reaffirmation of life for an ever-pulsating nuclear mysticism. Long live Gala. Long live Dali. For this final stage, one can choose to go back into any of the previous galleries if they wish to endure that treacherous journey once again. But it will be to no avail. So for now, as all good things come to an end, so must this. And I mean a real end. A physical death worthy of no rebirth. You can thank me later, Andre. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. I, I've got a vacuum cleaner in the background here, so I'm going to keep quiet, but I invite others to, uh, to speak. I guess I'll just jump. Oh, Manus, good. I thought you were gonna. I, Manus, go uh, ahead. I've just had a brief comment because it's it's definitely uh, hard to comment to critique this project. I really love the the video, uh, Andre. It's definitely very provocative, um, especially the part where you know AI is proposed that this kind of I don't know with re, uh, with this sort of religious overtones. And I was I kept looking at the shrine and I was wondering if if the shrine as as a, as a, as an icon of of our known kind of let's say religious slash ideological kind of past is necessary anymore when it comes to the glorification of this kind of technology whether i mean to me what i mean to say is that the shrine it's, is the ai the virtual environment itself it's it's this kind of walking through this kind of um the spaces that uh, you create through the paranoid um critical uh, process which the AI begins to imagine and, and keep shifting and changing. So that shrine is a mobile, uh, in mobile condition, in ever kind of changing flux. Uh, and I thought this was kind of interesting because, you know, it, it, the, the project can be obviously uh, discussed on, on many different layers, not so much necessarily as an architectural intervention. But I just wanted to, to, um, to ask you if you could maybe briefly comment on your own question as, as at the beginning, how you, you were trying to invert Dali's method to to go back to some of the original hallucinatory kind of origins. You know, what did you discover? You know, what, can you interpret it a little bit? Because again, the, the video is so open ended that it's uh, which is a great thing. But uh... so uh, the initial process was to take uh, Dali's work that already exists and compile it through a series of augmentations that would allow me to create new paintings through the generative uh, process. And so then the new images that are created are obviously flat in 2D, right? And so the idea of it was to create these shrines or these different environments in which I could perhaps display this artwork. 
And so it does have these types of different motifs which are struck between reality and things that we know and things perhaps that could change and be completely ephemeral and new. So it's this dance between what is known and what is known, but we also must always attach ourselves to something that is known and something that is static, right? Such as the shrines. And so that's why they were static and that's why they were uh, framed in a sense, because that's the way they are in the real world, but yet everything else could be changing around it. See, I guess it's interesting. It's very ironic even just to, to try to frame any one of those instances since, uh, you know, the AI, you know, and I guess as humans, you know, learning from one particular instance is not of much value. I mean, perhaps, you know, within our domain, it, work, it would work better. But again, to have some sort of an AI uh, output, you will need thousands uh, of, of, of inputs. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, you know, a tongue in cheek kind of uh, um, idea to just kind of isolate a discrete particular instance. So maybe, you know, I think to me, this is, this is, this is interesting. Um, just quick question on the process because there, there was no maybe having a kind of overall workflow uh, schematic would help us begin to to correlate those kind of um, ste discrete steps. Let's say in the training, uh, I would like to know more about what kind of data sets were used be beyond the original Dali paintings to actually create. The, what was any uh, what what kind of networks were used to kind of generate the later. Um, uh, images uh, that were used for the video or was it something uh, separate uh right so for the purpose of the workshop that we had with daniel balajan which i thank him so much for uh we used i used thalgans to produce uh these images that would eventually be that ephemeral delinean artwork and so then i I, I did leave some just on a 2D plane on this type of 3D virtual realm. But on others, they're uh, plasmated onto surfaces and livable and breathing. So they do have some type of form also within these type of environments. And uh, through the series of the process, I was also interested in looking at if perhaps Dali could be an architect. So I took things, for example, like his environment, Catalonia, New York, and Paris and mix them all together into a data set that would allow me to you know, play around the, with the idea of, okay, I already have this uh, network that is creating the linear images. So if I feed in an architectural data set, what could it come up with? And what would the DALI in the age of AI look like, for example? So it's, it's just like that open-ended, it's all really open-ended and kind of ephemeral in a sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I, I was, I, I mean, I really appreciated the, the, um, the open-endedness of this, I think. It was, I was highly suspicious of it, but, but Dali himself was so open-ended that um, in, in some sense, like he's maybe the only person that you can get away with. I mean, when you think about <laughs> Dali and his relationship to Catholicism, for example, or to, you know, the church, it's just like so, um, it, it is paranoid it is oppositional it is all these things um, and dedicated and devoted and you know everything and it's con and it's opposite so in that sense I thought that you kind of um, you wrote a very fine line between something that was kind of believable and as a as a form of inquiry um, uh, and something or something that was kind of you know like I don't know, maybe imagistic and kind of gim uh, gimmicky, but I was interested in, the, in you uh, as the creator and your appearance and disappearance in this and how you appeared. And I first thought that you became a woman when your voice became high and you, you and so then I thought that you, but then when you appeared as this glowing figure, you were obviously a tough guy, like uh, you mm -hmm. worked out a lot or you had a lot of machinery or, or both. <laughs> uh, and then you were kind of like examining your body in the mirror. It was very Lacanian. You were very, you were looking at yourself through a, this, you know, x-ray machine. It was kind of, it was kind of, you know, bizarre. And then at the end, you, um, I thought it was you talking to yourself when you were saying that you were going to like, this is the end on Andre and you, you were going to kind of close it out. So I, th I thought if, as a, like, if, 
if you had been able to explain something about, you know, the id, the identity of yourself in this and your own uh, kind of relationship to this um, kind of hallucin hallucination based on loosely on uh, Dali, that that would have been a kind of interesting part of, of looking at yourself as a creator and how you kind of entered this world. So I thought that was really successful and kind of interesting and don't know if you have any reflections on that. Absolutely. That was the idea to take this paranoid critical method and dive into it myself and uh, really explore all the possibilities and channels of it and really test that open-endedness, which is beautiful in its own way. I also wanted to just um, to say, Andre, that I really uh, appreciated this project. And um, I also, that was the part that John is talking about. Also, I found really interesting this, that, that kind of weirdness where I didn't know if it was critique or if it was exploration or, and, and that there was a certain kind of vulnerability, whether it was like a performed vulnerability or if it was really like really trying to push yourself. But the, the other thing I'm thinking about, um, I think based on like what Manos said and something about like, what Shermin has talked about is what is the criteria and, and something that's come up in a lot of these projects is like where you do the intervention or where like what are what are what is the part that you're actually kind of designing or curating and and so it would be interesting to kind of see what would happen if a paranoid critical method was applied to kind of the workflow for instance or to the way that you select the criteria. It feels like a lot of this work, really the, the potency of it is at the, um, at the, at, at the lower level or like the, the closer that you can get down to the platform and code, you know, that it, it will, so that like with the style gans, you're still dealing with the pixels and with the images. But when you can kind of, the deeper down you can go, obviously the more you're, communicating with the machine. And also then the more the, the results become more of an exploration that really truly starts to, yeah. Like what, it, what would be a paranoid critical workflow? It, it could be, I, I don't know how you would do that, but I, I don't know if you'd have to take mushrooms before you do it, or <laughs> I don't know what, what that would entail, but um, no, it's just interesting to see you all kind of do these, like, it, it, it's interesting to see different people's responses to working with these tools. And, and, it's, and it, it does raise more questions about then um, how to work with these tools or how, how, to, how to relate to them. And so anyway, I, I just really appreciate it. Thank you. I think the notion of, of the like a paranoid critical workflow could be super interesting. So I agree with uh, with the lead. It kind of reminds me Neil, of Ishmael's project a few years ago, not so much in terms of the focus, but in, in where that that could lead. And also with regards to the first project we saw today, Mateus, which was about memory. Uh, it's interesting to try and, and see how how memory taps into this. Since uh, you know, in, in in our case, typically we speak about this kind of let's say uh, we're conscious to some degree of our memories, but in, in, in this kind of state, you know, that Andre is exploring, maybe, you know, you know, it's about, you know, what kind of, if we, if that kind of inverse, inversal or reversal, let's say of, of the process maybe could lead to discovery what our memories are, like going back to, uh, you know, this undisclosing things, which we, we didn't know were already, you know, within us. And so it's kind of, um, it's interesting. I, I was just thinking, actually, I mean, I, I, I do think that, that Dali lends himself to a, a kind of AI treatment. I mean, I, I, um, in the sense of it, it kind of, it, it animates the world. I mean, that's the thing, I, I guess, about the paranoia. It's about walls have ears, have eyes. It's about animation in some, some way to, to want to go and open up architecture. And I think the, the key way to, to understand uh, Delirious New York is is through the lens of Dali, who's mentioned there. You know the fact that these skyscrapers come alive at night and have sex and God knows what else, and mm -hmm. that amazing video that Madeline 
Reasonable did that for, unfortunately is not available apart from a you know, secondhand online kind of thing, but was really astonishing. The big question I've got actually is what happened to that in 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 Rem Corlas's own oeuvre. I mean, you know, why didn't he bring that on board and make it part? Or maybe he did, and maybe we missed it. But you know, that that seems to me a, a really interesting thing. And I think to my mind, it's almost like a lens, a look, a looking way of looking at the world. That kind of like he he brings New York alive. Literally, it's, it's a kind of visceral experience in contrast to look a It's kind of completely abstract and rational suddenly new new york comes alive so it is a lens as well and um i i just did not see that in rem Corlas's own work and i maybe i've missed something there i also want to say that the kind of thing, the question about religion is, is is an interesting one and i i know that um um uh now i'm blanking on his name now it'll come back to me um Memo Acton always talks about uh, religiosity in the context of his work on AI. And it is interesting in some sense to know if you think about religion, I mean, apart from the word Google starts with the same three, two letters as God, I mean, somehow it's about kind of all the all seeing, all knowing eye kind of thing. And uh, the way in which we somehow put our trust in, in these technologies without fully understanding how they operate is something to do with the magical in any form of technology you understand you you can understand it as being magical so there's something incredibly interesting about the connection with, with religion uh as well um but let me step aside let other, others comment I, I was just going to say that i thought that some of the some of that early work of uh, rem kulhas lived on in miami in the first architectonica building the babylon if you look at the the, the drawings for the building, and it's called the Babylon for obvious reasons. Um, it's they're 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 cartoony, they're uh, they're surreal, like they're people having sex in the rooms, coming out of the showers, like things that you that Rem would never have dared to do in 1982. By that time, he had moved on, but they were still living somehow in the Magic City. So, just think maybe there's something there. Yeah, maybe I can add a, a comment about uh, about the uh, Kohas. I mean, um, comment of Neil about this paranoid critical method. Since the uh, in in a way, what he's saying is that uh, the, the man is capable of mobilizing like uh, uh, information that can be like an evidence of a suspicion. But finally, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's true because when when he's posted in the in the Lidis New York, he's not talking only about the Lidis, but he's only talking about Le Corbusier. In a way, and how he he said that he committed like a kind of crime, and then he put the the evidence, you know, <laughs> to to try to in a way to serve like a kind of um, you know support for his own theories. So in a way, I believe that we architects we manipulate a lot of times these kind of things, and it's like a kind of strategy. And uh, I'm, uh, maybe my my question about the project is like finally, what is the the, the big suspicion now between be, between all, all, all? I believe that that could be like a good question, not that for you to, to answer it now, but in a way it's like uh, this idea of the open state of, this, of, the, of the project can also talk about finally, okay, is there really a, a big suspicion between all, behind all this or, or, or and I believe that in a way it's connected with the comment of the lead, like how, how are you driving all this or how you are uh, designing with all this? Because finally what, what they do is this, and, Sometimes even the, the moment of the of the magic uh, or something magical could be also in the Le Corbusier, he performed like a kind of act you know, about New York in terms of he said like, okay, when he um, uh, talked about the plan Boisin and he said like, okay, so I have like this regular grid and then I don't know, it's, uh, Coca said like, it's like a rabbit in the hat, you know, like he just put the rabbit and then you know, all the buildings appear, no? The, 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 the towers appear. So I believe that uh, in that way, I connected all the comments, but in a way, I believe that uh, that's an interesting discussion in terms of architecture. I also can imagine that someone tell two Kulhas because I, I believe that it's really provocative. Uh, all all the, the proposals are really provocative. And I can imagine someone tell two Kulhas like, are you crazy? Are you are you going to write a book about <laughs> postcards? <laughs> and, I mean, are you going to build like a retro retroactive um, story about New York, but New York doesn't have any history in a way. <laughs> no, I believe that, that, that that's, but I believe that this is a, a big provocation that you can continue in terms to rethink um, a theory of architecture that can help you to design as well. So I believe it's a really great thing. Yeah. I mean, let me just add a comment there about Rem. I think 
when I first saw Remy, uh, I, I, I didn't quite get what he was saying. And then someone said, listen, you've got to see him through the lens of Dutch humor. It's all incredibly dry Dutch humor and you wouldn't recognize it unless you're Dutch, right? But then you start realizing there is another Rem. I mean, like OMA, what does that mean? That's the Dutch for grandmother. He's got a, an office called grandmother in <laughs> Rotterdam. I, mean, I think there's some, there's, there's kind of, there, there is a kind of REM to be kind of, um, as an archeologist, to, to be kind of discovered, to, to be understood in order to understand REM, I think you've got to dig a bit deeper than, than what you see on the surface. I don't know whether Aya would like to say something. It must be kind of curious. Aya is, was uh, uh, teaching a uh, studio um, a bit for the first half and couldn't join us. Um, and has parachuted into this kind of strange Dali-esque landscape. Um, um, I, I don't know what you'd like to say. I don't want to put you on the spot, Aya. Yeah, I just feel like I, I tuned in and I feel like I walked into Dali's kind of mind, uh, reimagined and uh, kind of immortalized in a way. Uh, it's definitely quite an interesting uh, perspective to this kind of uh, genius and his work and the way he... Um, he kind of applied uh, his theories and ideas in his art. Um, I, I mean, I, I truly enjoyed this whole video and it was quite inspiring. So thank you so much for that, Andre. Thank you. you, know, if, you if you have time, can I make a quick comment? Sure. Okay, uh, so thank you, Andre. I really appreciate and I like your approach to the research. I just wondered when you mentioned in the presentation moving towards 3D, I wondered um, what could have been possibly done if you would um, move into uh, 3D in a way that AI generates the three-dimensional space, the whole space. Because I noticed there is, in your exhibition, there is um, a kind of a framed AI kind of videos playing here and there, but the whole space is not AI generated, right? So it's more like your like platform or gaming uh, kind of uh, environment. So um, I wonder if it could have been possible to train an AI on your subconscious kind of um, like things that trigger uh, trigger you uh, or uh, actually from your memory, from your hallucination, from, from your dreams, and then letting AI three uh, or um, breed this kind of hallucination and then three-dimensionalize it into a whole space. That could have been, I think, interesting also. Yeah, but a very interesting research, very provocative, and we can debate and discuss a lot about it. <laughs> but I appreciate that you're very brave to actually go into this kind of line of research. Thank you. Thank you. You're muted, Lich. I was going to say, do we have any any further comments before we move on? Um, okay, um, so let's uh, welcome Yulia. Um, thank you, Andre. Um, just to say, it'd be good if if you if everyone keeps kind of images up there while you're presenting, just to remind us while you're talk, after in the discussion afterwards, just to remind us of the project that you've uh, been talking about. Hello, can you hear me? Can you see what I'm sharing? Yes. Um, okay. Hi. It's sorry, just the Zoom is on the way <laughs> to control it. Okay. Uh, my thesis is focusing on uh, virtual communication and maybe in some way challenging how can we communicate. Uh, so pandemic, how tired we are talking about it, but at the same time, it affected our lives like the prior pandemics before it. And it affected a lot of people in the sense that some benefited from it, from working at home and being connected to so many people online uh, around the world. But a lot of people get affected a bit, uh, for it mentally and not in a positive way. So a recent study show the 40% of people uh, of adults reported symptoms of anxiety and depression compared to 11% prior to it. And especially the kids are super affected. 
by the loneliness and isolation as a main factor. So I was questioning how in the world when we have 4 billion people uh, connecting to the um, uh, internet, we still feel very lonely and isolated when we get separated at home. Why we cannot uh, connect and create meaningful connections through virtual spaces, which in some sense, they provide an addition to our communication, but they do not substitute it. And what is the role of the physical space in this communication? And it came to the idea with what if I try to create my own virtual space and the virtual communication method. And first I started with a representation of people, which we call like an avatars. And it would not be a literal representation of people, but a uh, something that captures the essence of them and what better captures the essence than particles. Because uh, particles only make things when they interact with each other. It, uh, it depends how particles interact uh, with each other to have things making in this world. And uh, then I looked at the research of how else people capture essence. There's uh, this a lot of talk about like people auras and different colors of aura. And I took this idea, which is, might be ridiculous, but I took this idea and having how we can have emotions represented by uh, different colors in this virtual space and then based on that, create some kind of idea of the avatars and uh, the representing your mood. And with the uh, advancing and AI reading the EKG uh, data, it's, it's getting more possible. It's not yet possible in our uh, schoolwork because the EKGs are not very accessible yet, but in possible future, we might have the working. So, so what is the role of physical and how we put these avatars into a physical space? Well, what if we infiltrate our physical space through this avatar and maybe encode messages so we don't have to communicate through words? Um, so how would can we encode the messages? Uh, so we need to start with the code. So I have a basic three-dimensional representation of space, the one that we can as humans, three-dimensional humans perceive so far. And what if I make a, a, a kind of a code out of that, encoding the, our words? So our words would be encoded in the physical space and uh, having uh, like the smallest unit com in combination, creating words. We create some certain rules for that as well. And I started coming up with a dictionary. What if I would mean the dot would pop up there and sparse the particle from that specific spot? And what if uh, the other word can be the source of the particle from a different spatial uh, part of the space? And we can go further and create more and more words and go further along with that and create an uh, unlimited amount of them. And but one word communicating is kind of like an old fashioned way, I think. And what if we just encode a whole phrase into a space? So the whole phrase would be a message encoded in a space and uh, this code would be a source of these particles. Uh, the message would be the source of these particles and the movement of these particles would be based on a mood of a person. So how would actually like visual, I see how it would work. So the particles would emit from the certain spaces. For instance, this would say, I love you, right? And they would follow and uh, attract it to a person inside the room, but the particles movement would uh, basically be based on the mood of a person. Hello. So here's trying to provide the example some way. So whatever this person is saying would be reflected on the other person's space not in the backwards hello hi how are you feeling i'm okay are you still angry at me i'm not angry i'm disappointed i'm sorry i didn't want to make you sad i love you so as you can see the messages you can say so far would be triggered to produce this uh, certain code when the particles are getting emitted from. And for instance, like we mentioned earlier, what if a person is saying one thing, but thinking another thing? It's projecting, uh, I'm okay, 
it's the person saying I'm okay, but it's actually angry. And the other person would be able to actually pick up on that and move the conversation from it. So how would you would see it from the first point of view? And also the particle would react to the voice right now. And for the future, I'm thinking, what if we don't need an actual word to be encoded into message, visual messages? What if we can just in some like neural link connect our brains into the system and having this type of our way of communication? Mm -hmm. And that will finish my presentation. So, so let me ask you, is this, is this kind of, um, are these kind of like emojis of the future? Like I, I'm constantly trying to figure out what emojis mean exactly what. And, you know, because they have, they're complex and there's really no good emoji dictionary out there that kind of translates back and forth. But you can imagine an entire conversation written with these visual cues. Yours, however, are incredibly interesting. And this is the beginning of this new language, I think is, is kind of filled with amazing potential. I just, I, I mean, I'm just like um, kind of super interested in kind of how then like <laughs> almost anything that you see any particle movement could be potentially picked up by somebody and translated. And I, I guess I'm really interested in that translation, uh, like how you go from um, uh, the, the, from saying something that you know is being revealed to be a little bit more than what you, you know, like when you say, oh, I'm having a good day. And then you put like a little, you know, emoji face with the sweat bead running down, you know, it's like, oh, okay, it's a good day, but it's like, mm, it could be better. I'm a little stressed. That I think you have the potential to really unpack into this, like, yeah, I'm having a good day. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're not sad, but you can, there are all these other layers of emotion that you can kind of, you can kind of um, articulate. I'm wondering how you kind of understand that from the other point of view. Like if you started with something, um, you know, if I just walked into a room and I'm looking at this, like, would it be translated for me right away into a language that I understand like English or something like that? Or would it be, or would it be something that I would not only understand in language, but feel like directly? Do you have a, have you been thinking, obviously you've been thinking a lot about this, but do you have a, a thoughts on that? So yeah, first of all, yeah, I do look at it as kind of addition to the message at the beginning, and then it can be involved into people understand like, understanding it without the actual words like even with emojis as you mentioned earlier you can encode the whole message just with emojis and but it did not happen at the beginning and happened it evolved into that and i think a lot of things can be encoded in emojis actually even better than through the words for instance or especially like stickers right now are very popular that you can communicate with stickers even with people with the, who don't speak your language and uh, kind of improve it into more um, sensational feeling of that. And I envision it at the beginning as more in a VR experience that you can see this particle flying in 3D, 3D but with the uh, evolution of technology like uh, HoloLenses and things like that, that could be possibly be added to the existing reality. I mean, and I could imagine you could see things like um, you could, particles could help you understand like whether a, a bus that's coming into the station is full or not without you even having to see it. Like you just start to understand the ways mm -hmm. in which the moving particles or whether plants need to be watered or like they could be talking, telling you all of the stuff around you. So everything could kind of be speaking to you without, with a language that you'd have to kind of start to understand and feel. But no, I think it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating proposition. Thank you um, for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, it starts to suggest also a kind of um, a way that you could communicate with, with other beings, with other matter, like with other, you know, like with other, not just other species, but like with other 
well, I guess you could with, with the plants or even with non-organic things, it seems to suggest something, uh, a communication that goes beyond human in a way, you know? But there's also, I just really enjoyed your presentation. Just the visual graphic quality of it was really good. It's really nice. And there was also something really interesting. I don't really know what I was looking at exactly, but you had where you had the two spaces together. It's almost like the spaces were speaking to each other or the atmospheres were speaking to each other. There was just something really provocative or just really interesting about this, um, about the spatial qualities or overlays of, I, I guess it's, yeah, I guess it just becomes another overlay, right? Like an augmented uh, situation, um, atmosphere that inhabits the space or is transmitted through the space. Um, I, I had something I was gonna say, uh, I can't really remember, but um, yeah, it seems like you're really like on the, it's 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 something that very um it's really really interesting there is this artist uh allison parish who works with language and she's done these things where she's mapped she works she does she works with a lot of uh nlp and machine learning uh she she has like a lot of generative poem like she she's like a generative poet and and, but she also does, she's done these like experiments where she creates like three-dimensional space with the language mm -hmm. or she generates it. So I don't know, she'd be, I'll, I'll see if I can find a, a link and send it to you because she's really excellent. And it, it's, uh, yeah, it just seemed like there's something there that might be of use to you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for that. Yes, I, and if, go, well, ahead, go ahead, Manas. <laughs> okay, so um, I agree with Elite's points, and I, I mean, to add to her points, I really find this type of research um, advancing this uh, communication, uh, other communication methods with, let's say, children, with uh, pets, with the um, autistic um, people mm -hmm. or people who cannot actually be verbal. And I think this this becomes really, um, I mean, uh, fascinating. So it seems that um, these particles moving around almost suggest like a hologram effect in the three dimension in the physical space. And I um, I have two maybe uh, uh, questions or comments um, for you, uh, Julia. Is that when you actually had the translation catalog? in terms of this abstract uh, point versus line and edge, and re this represents something. I think this could have been actually really exciting, but maybe because it's still abstract, we still debate whether it's really representing. So I think moving forward, and I know that it's just a master thesis, but and you've done a lot of work, but I think further investigation can include um, this type of uh, like, how do we translate certain um, semantics or emotions into um, visual representation that can become actually um, interpreted into um, like um, the mood or the environment that express I'm being happy or tired or things like that. And also, uh, so this communication to be really successful and this universal language that when the space hologram, these particle changes, everyone in the space know what's happening or at least without verbally uh, speaking. And then the other thing I was wondering is whether you really want this hologram effect or the space of re being responsive becomes this uh, actually combination of tactile or tangible um, responses in addition to this digital hologram. Yeah, these are, if you wanna add to, to these points, I think I'm, I'm thinking of moving forward because I think your research is very exciting. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I think, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add that, yeah, I definitely would have to do more research about how you can track what you actually feel and there is a lot of 
research right now with like EKG and EGG uh, to see what you actually feel and how AI can uh, determine that. So that definitely could be a great possibility. I think also with regards to uh, Charmaine also touched on two of the points that I was thinking among other things. First of all, Julia, I really enjoyed the presentation. I think it's a very rich discussion that can be opened up through, through this kind of investigation. The first thing was that I was originally very excited when, when you started showing the, the logic of encoding from text to, to, to shapes. I was a little bit skeptical. And I think, you know, already Charmaine pointed out that I think this, this stage becomes important because let's say you have um, moments where consecutive letters or words start to have overlapping shapes. So when you have the same exact pattern overlapping, does that impact in some way the visual output? Does that become brighter? So is there some way that the decoding can be somewhat controlled um, so that it's kind of differentiated more? Otherwise it becomes kind of arbitrary. The second thing was this kind of relationship to uh, the dependence to exclusively, um, you know, decoding from, let's say, uh, a conversation into something that is indeed visual or it's more um, a communication through emotions, because that was your original statement, which I think could be something that is, of course, technologically speaking, uh, something that potentially happen later on. So in this case, it will be the absence of this kind of uh, catalog of, of a vocabulary, all this alphabet that is required to encode and decode, where, where the a more direct, let's say, nervous signal, perhaps through some kind of EEG or other kind of medium, would allow the translation from, from uh, electrical signal to direct visual output of the point cloud or whatever it is that you're, you're, you're showing, right? And then the other thing I was thinking is that whether, as Charmin also asked, whether this is, what is the relationship to or the necessity to, to somehow manifest through another physical layer. I know your, your original um, intention is that this is more, uh, was prompted by this kind of absence of access to some particular physical medium, but perhaps it speaks to some, some kind of pure architectural scaffold where we can all access and through, for, for example, pressure um, sensors. And I'm thinking of the work of Sean Alquist because this is also somewhat related to um, autistic um, uh, uh, people. You know whether this could be necessary in terms of that could be the the, the decoder or the encoder of your own input uh, prior to translation to some kind of visual. So let's say that you have some kind of um, generic um, surface on which, through particular tapping or pressuring you could begin to generate some of those visualizations, which could, of course, be uh, corresponding to particular sense of emotion, like, let's say, higher pressure, higher intensity, or longer uh, exposure of your, you know, of your hands with the surface and so on. I know this is, opens up a lot of uh, uh, questions, but just wanted to kind of say that it's, it's a very rich project, and for sure, it's kind of uh, uh, super interesting to see where, where that can lead. Yes, thank you for your comments. So uh, first one was for the code. And I there is like, um, first there was an idea to have it in code like that from reading the motion, reading the pulse, but um, through the research I found that it's yet insufficient and with especially uh, the resources we have right now. But that's why the code started to develop as a code to, um, to encode, I said code a lot, but to encode the message, uh, the um, audio message. Uh, and the, to answer your question, for right now, I have it as, as the um, points overlap or like vertices overlap, they become uh, brighter and having more particles generated to work with. Um, uh, and with another physical, um, uh, so overlay as another physical overlay. So I was thinking of that as, for instance, we have uh, Zoom. And if you turn off the camera on Zoom, you basically not present in there and because nobody can see you. But being on camera all day long is a tiring process, especially you probably can relate to it as teachers being 
on Zoom for hours and hours. And it's like a constant surveillance. But also without this uh, visual hue, cues that we have from facial expression, it's hard to tell uh, people's um, intentions and sometimes in feel their presence. That's why this physical overlay came into the play. I, I was just thinking, I mean, um, whether we need to even have a code to translate the words. I mean, just because of, I don't know, we, we've touched upon GPT-3 and, and natural language processing, but um, uh, there's the, just recently, in fact, actually on, on, on Friday, um, Theodorus, one of our DDES students, um, was showing you how he had started to break into clip. I think he's the first person to do that for architecture and try and kind of uh, use language to immediately to generate architectural forms out of that. Um, I was, I was also the, the, I mean, I guess something on the, on the in the chat which um, I wanted to share with you, which if you don't know about, you have to look at, which is to say the uh, the monkey, the Neuralink monkey. Um, this is the year of the monkey. Um, and uh, it's actually, it's it's astonishing. And it's also kind of disturbing in a way that uh, a monkey can play mind pong, literally can play pong on a screen with its mind. Um, and that's an immediate kind of translation, as it were, from thoughts into 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 a kind of form of action. And, and But what was interesting also, it, then, then you, Elon Musk has, has gone to say, well, actually in five years time, we won't need language. Um, that's his thinking. Now, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, Slavoj Žižek's response to that, and he just produced a book um, on that kind of question. I mean, first of all, he's horrified by the possibility of controlling someone's mind from the outside. He's very worried about that anyway. But he takes the view that actually you can't get beyond language. I mean, it, and he argues it. I mean, to simply say that, that from a kind of Lacanian perspective, that the uh, the unconscious is structured like a language. In other words, you kind of like you, you, um, uh, you need to express it in a form of language. At least that's that's the kind of theory, and I don't know who is right or wrong for that. But I I thought that comment that I think was it um, uh, 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 Manos made about the possibility of um, of of people who can't who, who are nonverbal, and, that, and that's Sean Alquist's daughter. Um, it'd be really interesting to know you know what happened if you were to connect whether she could express herself in some way, um, and how would it manifest itself having not learned to speak as such and that that's astonishing in itself so i think there are lots of interesting kind of questions that it, that it raises but I, I i suspect that we can go straight into um from language into something else we don't, we don't need to find these codes and I, and I think that was probably the least convincing part because of the the this the kind of the 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 code you had that was not so i mean we spoke about this before right the, the, the difference between i and you and the, like it wasn't necessarily so 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 obvious but nonetheless there's a possibility out there that it could it could do this um so um i i i just want to agree that this is kind of like on, ongoing research i mean almost all the projects that i have today are kind of not finished they're kind of opening up a new uh line of inquiry um so i just wonder if we got any other further comments about this project I believe that uh, in base of what you said, Neil, the, the, the idea of the, the suggestion of John about the, the emoji, no, the, the Japanese emoji are part like uh, the, the real code behind all this, no, because it's like this pictogram and how you, in a way you um, can speak through uh, something that is not exactly, or if it's not exactly coded in the same way that we, we usually speak with, uh, you know, with characters, even in the language that we are, because we have different kind of uh, alphabets, no, uh, as well. Yulia is a Russian, so she uses uh, Cyrillic, and I'm Argentinian, so I use the 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 Latin. The, the, in in a way, the the the, the um, sorry, the, the the way we speak is uh, the, the way we spoke uh, is different in terms of code, but at the same time, we can send an emotion and we can understand each other. Uh, that, I mean, that maybe that could be like a good uh, comment of uh, from Sean. I, I, I mean, I, I, the, the tragedy is that, that Stephen Hawking died maybe two or three years before they could really kind of use some of these technologies. And, and although, according to Zizek, he apparently he commented, I don't know whether he'd use something like Neuralink, but apparently he could move his wheelchair forward or backwards through uh, um, through through thoughts alone. Um, I actually bought my house from Stephen Hawking, and he and he, he can't write, so he's got this. A, th a thumbprint, which has been totally smudged as, as his signature, 
but it, but it kind of it does open up that possibility of, of, of people who are paraplegics being able to sort of move and, and so on and so on. So uh, alongside the more scary side of things. Um, and in, in, in that way, this code changed the way you think. Like, for example, I think like in an in Arabic uh, code and uh, Julia thinking, uh, <laughs> you know, Cyrillic code. <laughs> And this is like the, the certain limits for our world. And then when you expand your code, you expand also your, your thoughts or the, the way you think. I, I know just this like super philosophical question, but I believe that it's, a, it's an incredible uh, work. Yulia. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I don't know how that would work in terms of different languages. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your yeah, comments. Yeah, okay. um, so I think it's Eva next, is that right? <clears throat> um, is, oh, I got that right. I'm just checking the, the, the yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. I'm trying to see where to share the screen. Oh, so the bottom. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. I see. All right. Uh, Okay, good afternoon. My name is Ivo Rodinoni, and this is my master's thesis for Neo Leach's class. My thesis is focused on object detection systems such as those found in autonomous vehicles. What you are seeing is an example taken from a Tesla. I have trained the conventional neural network to recognize Zaha Hadid buildings to then in turn study influence. This video of the reference Zaha Hadid was trained with a 0.5 threshold, which refers to the minimum confidence score required for a predicted bounding box to be included in the output. This video of the student, Ma Yen Song, has been trained with a more liberal threshold of 0 0.01, as are the rest of the images and videos I will show.
for the contemporary I have processed Patrick Schumacher's designs. For the teacher, I have processed REM cool house designs. This is the final image. Thank you for watching. And that is my master's thesis. I think um, we have to uh, we have to ask Aya as somebody who was trained by I don't know whether it was Patrick or certainly in, in the uh, you might have been contaminated by Patrick Aya. Of course, we all are <laughs> uh, at the AA. But uh, yeah, I was actually in uh, Doctor Theodore's uh, studio. But for sure, uh, Patrick's influence is uh, everywhere in the DRL. Um, I think, I mean, this project is definitely uh, quite interesting. Um, I, I was kind of uh, waiting for you to slightly kind of uh, narrate your uh, your process or how did you kind of uh, reach yes. Um, yes. this kind of product? Uh, do you want to give us a comment about that? Sure, yeah. I use something that's called a convolutional neural network where you implement images. So I implemented over a thousand Zaha Hadid buildings. The AI goes um, associating them, um, breaks them down into uh, different sections, and then it interprets based on the, the threshold um, what is 
what is uh, just like just like the Teslas do. They 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 feed them a a bunch of messages of uh, images of people, and then the machine, in turn, after being trained over and over and over again, identifies the object as a person compared to a car or such. So with um, with design, it's a lot more complex. So it took a little longer, and it's not perfect as you saw. Um, but that's the process. So, Ivo, yeah. just to build up Aya's question, I think we need a little bit more information than that because if this is a design thesis, then um, understand the video is part of the process, but it's not very self. It's not self-explanatory at all, to be honest, right? Uh, when you were explaining the structure of the neural network, then that becomes more interesting. But it wasn't so clear in the beginning exactly how we're supposed to follow. And I was also waiting, to be honest, for some kind of narrative while the video was playing. So for future reference, I think this would be would be very useful. Um, but I mean, we kind of get that this is part of an evaluate, evaluative network rather than a generative network, so to speak. So what was not clear is I was trying to follow at some point the, the framing with the values and they didn't always correspond. So I think what is currently, at least for me, not there yet is your own interpretation of whether the network is actually successful in you know, this kind of classification or this prediction of, uh, matching, of value matching, going back to the original data sets and whether you know, the categories that you are trying to interpret are actually there or, or, or not. Yeah, well, uh, in part, it's both. It's successful, and it's also, it's not, um, it, it, it doesn't work. It's not perfect, not not at all. There's a lot of things it picks up on that, that it shouldn't be picking up on. Um, this is due to, it's still a, it's still a new, a new um, approach to, to something. Um, as for the narration during the videos, I actually had, um, I actually had music in the videos, but because of YouTube's um, copyright laws, um, I had to last moment get rid of the, the noise. So th there was supposed to be music playing, so I was a little, so it wasn't so entertaining um, in that aspect. But yeah, I hope that explains a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think that, that I mean, um, I think you need to push this a bit further. Um, so, I mean, first of all, it, it I, I, it, it kind of gives you a range of different values. Um, uh, uh, what if you were to do the same with a, I don't know, a bunch of bananas or something? You know, <laughs> would that give us? Would that be very useful? Um, or indeed, since the kind of the initial uh, neural network was able to distinguish a, a bicycle from a person from a what well, a traffic light or something like that, you know, te technically you could be training the neural network on on several different architects and then trying to trace which is the most influential one, potentially. I mean, I do think that the whole, that it's actually quite a tricky problem because in a sense, I mean, what would it register? If you think about a, a simple curve, when there's nothing simple about the curves used in Zaha, right? They, they, they are very deliberate in many ways. Um, but the point is when you see that curve from different angles is in 3D, you will never be able to really kind of define what that curve is precisely. So it's, it's never going to be very, very, um, uh, uh, Effective. Well, we don't know that. I mean, I think that would it would be. I think the next step would have been to really test out this system and, and, and to see how effective it was. You know, how successful was it in getting it right? And because um, that that would have been, to my mind, really kind of interesting. So um, uh, there's something. There's something. Uh, yeah. There's something there. I, I just think the kind of the comment that was. I mean, the music wouldn't have wouldn't have explained anything. I think it, what we needed to have the process explained more clearly for those who were following it in, in a sense or hadn't been part of the, the whole history of the semester. And it's difficult as maybe to step outside yourself and sort of think, well, how would someone else see that? But it probably would have been useful to try and take people through this so they could, uh, you could really explain what was going on. Because there was a lot of, there was a series of thoughts that were going on in, in terms of the process. Um, but technically, you know, I think if you were to kind of stitch this together in some kind of way, it, it kind of reminded me of the work, potentially the work that, that um, uh the marina is kind of doing on mapping these kind of the these kind of zones of influence and if you can see it in a kind of this kind of charles jenks sort of map of these kind of fluid and dynamic uh, um 
processes, um, it, it could potentially do that. But I think you need to be much more tough with it and, and, and really ask tough questions. I think I'm, that's one of the, I'll oh, go ahead, Shri. Sorry, Hari. Uh, I speak more than you, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I think uh, it's what Neil's saying just now, and I think you needed to frame the problem or, or, or what you were trying to solve, which I think was a little bit lost. Uh, I think that this was, um, <clears throat> I think it's commendable to to explore, uh, you know, AI and and these different types of routes and step outside of your discipline and see how they can attach to it. But I think uh, this is kind of the first path or the first level that you should have been. Uh, and, I, and I think that this could have been a lot further. Um, there's a couple of things just seeing, because I've used convolutional networks before, um, that I'm seeing that we're not here. For example, your, your labeling system, everything is saying Zaha, so that leads me to believe that uh, um, you, were just, you just had one output, right? And your threshold was set very low, so you were getting output, which leads me also to believe that you, are, with the data that you were using, you were using a deep, uh, convolutional neural network, which uh, which is also using um, unsupervised learning because you didn't label your data sets, right? So, but what all that means is that um, there was points in the video where there was uh, an umbrella and it was labeling that as a Zaha building or a curtain or a tree, you know, and that is your threshold was too far. The feature extraction that it was doing was just getting curves and uh, implying that or, or stating that that was some type of Zaha form, right? So when you have a supervised learning and you're labeling your data, you're able to extract more key information. Um, but that that would have been harder to get along if you didn't if you didn't get to the first part, which would get a clear objective. Perhaps you were a, a better use of this or better objective would have been to develop a some type of convolutional network that can evaluate derivatives of architecture based on certain styles. Uh, and then from there, that's going to inform you on what type of data to acquire. And then from there, that's going to inform what type of how you're labeling your data. Um, as all the other jurors have said, it would have been nice to see what your process was, what convolutional network you were using, what styles, what, what techniques were you using. Did you use transfer learning? Did you train it from scratch? Uh, did you use some, some type of a pre-built neural network that was trained on other objects, which is some type of tra transfer learning? So we could have uh, appreciated a little bit more how you got to this point. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and to add to Jorge's points, I think, um, first of all, um, Ivo, I just wanted to um, make a quick comment and then a question. The comment is on, um, like, when, when you were uh, showing us the video on Zaha's uh, building, uh, there are moments that can be really tricky uh, to train the neural network when it comes to very zoomed in um, facade uh, kind of image which has just window and i think this can be um, uh, also seen in other non-zaha buildings right so i think i think that that can become confusing for the neural network so you might be um, avoiding that scenario where it's too much zoomed in so that we lose actually the Zaha curvature and all of the kind of the language of, of, of Zaha. Um, the other thing, um, my main question I think is that um, for the driverless cars research like Tesla and other um, research happening, there is the process of uh, semantic uh, segmentation and labeling like, uh, like similar to what you've done for a certain purpose, which is actually for the for the car to uh, to automate driving basically and for the car to drive safely right uh, so that it knows when a human is moving there is a tree there is so that it avoids collision and accidents for your research what is the actual main objective the main objective is to is to trace influence a sort of genealogy of is it possible to train a, a, a neural network to um, be able to recognize a certain pattern within an architect's design and how that pattern is shown throughout um, other works. Yes, it seems that this is one objective of, I think I was wondering if there is a more ultimate objective of uh, moving more to the generative aspect rather than 
uh, recognition, like we're recognizing Zaha and other kind of um, images that you have. So from my perspective, when, since I was reading this generative deep learning book by David Foster, he was talking about this classification research on AI is very already kind of well developed because there is uh, always this purpose of automation, right? So we need to know like um, uh, this, these kind of labels and, and classification become really important. But I think we're more, as architects, we're more excited about the um, unsupervised, the generative networks that can generate design for us, right? And from my perspective, I think you may wanna, um, in your further uh, research or improvement is that you may wanna reframe your ultimate objective in terms of how does this lead to um, new perception or new design process or new um, or innovative method uh, in, in terms of uh, generative process or design process in architecture. I don't know if, if there is a clear answer. I think this is a, maybe an ongoing longer term question that you may need to consider. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to jump in and maybe build on the last two comments. I. <laughs> I, I would say that um, just uh, um, imagine if you're presenting this to a client, like, a, a, you know, you have to, at some level, you have to say what you're, what you're about, and then where you're going with it. And then, uh, and then my question would be, what are you challenging in the field? Like, what is this thing that you're creating that is saying to the, the architecture field in general, you guys are missing this huge thing. I found it. I'm making an algorithm to identify fi it. And back to what Charmaine was saying, now it can do this for you. So maybe the hat here is that you should think about yourself in multiple hats as a, uh, basically as a, a researcher, an inventor, because you're inventing something, you're imagining something. But then in the end, how do you make it into some sort of product or your tool as a designer. And I think I go back to, if I'm going to make something, everything that I make is about making the thing. So ultimately, uh, you know, here's a thought. So I'm thinking, oh, wow, I see all these things. Is it about having these algorithms uh, and you taking a million drones and going out to Mars? And you're I tr trying to identify geometry because if there's a geometry that could be found that is, you know, Cartesian in nature, then there was an intelligent species. I'm just like putting something crazy out there, but there's an objective to it, right? So I'm thinking, what is your objective? And I think Neil is, uh, I think one of those researchers that you can go really abstract and then he'll actually capture it and say, great, and now what? So I think you should challenge yourself in kind of speculating some sort of problem and then solution that you're, 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 you're proposing for that problem. But anyway, thank you very much. Okay, to that point, um, there was the idea of it's speculation, but um, in a sense, being able to use it uh, for copyright, which in architecture is a huge problem. Um, it's hard to say whose design is this, whose design is that. So that could be one of the ways that it could be um, turned into a product um, down the line, but that's a whole another um, aspect to it. Oh, and just to say that, you know, like just to think about it in that way, you know, three-dimensional models is data. So at some level, you're right, this could be useful one day if we democratize all of data, uh, you know, who does what? So I wouldn't, you know, the way that you pose this solution, oh yeah, it was for copyright and it's a problem. Well, I bet you if you spent like a few days with a top researcher, you can probably come up with a really good framing and a, a series of policies that could be implemented. And that's also part of the, the the process of the architect i would say you're looking at its totality and i think that's extremely valuable and provocative for the field got it thank you i just actually i i don't think the copyright is such a such a, 
an issue. And th- I mean, like people are worried about copyright, but I think the greatest thing is if people do copy you. You know, the fact that Patrick introduces this term parametrism, which I don't really agree with, but the fact that everyone uses it, you should be very happy that people are using it. It's almost like you want to be kind of followed by everyone. Um, okay, let's 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 um, move on to uh, Mario and Roxana. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Mario? Yes, hello. This sharing screen. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Hello, I'm Mario. Um, and this is my partner, Roxana. Hi, guys. For our project, we went on an exploration of the impact that architectural space has on the human psyche. Um, throughout our process, we established a set of experiments in order to assess the impact that different stimulus, including architecture, have on people. Um, as Kenzo Tang stated, in architecture, the demand was no longer for box-like forms but for buildings that have something to say to the human emotions. Throughout our exploration, uh, we researched the works of Nat Chard's collective spatial study done in 1993, uh, where he shows that two people walking together, there's a blob that shows um, an idea of their collective consciousness Uh, which as you can see is organic and not uniform, while the gray fields that are there is what they're perceiving directly in front of them and what they're imagining is right behind them. Uh, The vertical yellow lines is the unresolved sense of context. So essentially this study conveys that both space and the individuals occupying it are mutually impactful to one another. Nat Chard's stair and hallway looks to the implications that a range of emerging new technologies might have on architecture. One in particular, Intelligent Gel, offered the possibility of an active, flexible surface. In the perspective section, someone walks in a hallway that is sensitive to her desires and anxieties. These are translated spatially and detected for the natural electronic signals in her skin. Um, In the stepping up image, you can see there Uh, practical movements, such as when the ground moves up to accept each of um, the person's steps. In the final image, two people go their own ways while the space tries to reconcile their composited desires and anxieties. Emotions have the possibility to elicit physiological responses from the person experiencing them. Uh, They activate a sympathetic nervous system, which leads to physical responses such as uh, rise blood pressure and body temperature and also faster heart rate. Some of the most frequently emotions are happiness, excitement, gratefulness, contentment, relaxation, etc. One of the most relevant indicators that space plays a role in the disposition of its inhabitants is the impact the quarantine during lockdown has had on people due to COVID. And this is study conducted by Suvrati Bansal and a group of scientists uh, was to explore the degree of psychological distress in the terms of depression, anxiety, and stress among the adult population in India uh, during the strict 21 days mandatory lockdown. A cross-sectional study uh, survey was designed um, and was adopted to help validate the questionnaire. About 83% of the participants uh, were unmarried and 76% were students. The number of women was slightly more than men, uh, 58% compared to 42% respectively. Maria? The reported prevalence of depression was around 31% which was the highest among the variables of physiological health, anxiety. Um, Anxiety was also reported by 22%, followed by stress, which was seen in 11% of the participants. The graph uh, here depicts the prevalence of depression. 
anxiety and stress in the study, and the table shows the distribution according to the duration of lockdown, with them reported significantly higher on the third week as compared to the second week. The study suggests that there is a progressively detrimental impact of lockdown on various aspects of physiological health, such as an eight to 10 fold increase on the prevalence of depression and anxiety as compared to the baseline statistics in the population. In order to begin getting accurate results, we needed to focus on a specific uh, stimulant such as color, since colors and emotion are closely linked. It is important to know that the colors can be subjective. What might one person feel and um, be cheerful with can make another person feel irritated on the viewers, based on the viewer's past experiences or cultural differences. Warm colors, for example, can often evoke feelings of happiness, optimism, and energy, while cool colors usually have a calming and soothing effect, but it can also express sadness. Our main focus was the facial recognition uh, program, which was used to quantify emotions as accurately as possible. The human brain recognizes emotions automatically and software has now been developed that can recognize um, emotions as well. This technology is becoming more precise all the time and we eventually be able to read emotions as well as our brains do. Um, we first tested Okay, here we first tested the emotional response to color among 10 participants with a software that recognizes seven emotions. Uh, they are anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, surprise, and the feeling of being neutral. The colors were set up to trigger uh, once it detected a change in the participant's emotion. This has the possibility to moderate the participant's disposition if fed uh, the proper context. We also recorded their heart rate throughout the experiment and noticed that many displays a reduction in heart rate when they were happy. So as we moved along the process of testing different variables, we incorporated GANs to record the emotions towards uh, interpolating environments. GANs have the potential to learn from the data set that it's provided, which can impact architecture in the near future. Um, similarly to the color triggers, this demonstration is set to react to changes in the user's facial emotion recognition. When the participant shows the assigned emotion in their face, such as anger, um, which it would be set as the trigger, the software automatically switches to new content. Uh, we continued running tests on these GANs to incorporate heart rate as well. In order to create a more uh, immersive experience for the user, we transferred the GANs to a virtual environment and continued testing. The results were consistent with when the content was on Morphfest, um, showing a lower heart rate when the user was happy, for example. Um, this is our eighth participant here testing the Coral GAN in VR. Um, one of the aspects of space that plays a role in its impact on users is whether or not it's a public or private space. So these tests contrasted a uh, crowded area at Ultra Music Festival compared to a very quiet and private beach. On average, the participants were more content with the beach environment than the ultra environment, which had more of a uh, polarizing result. Users tended to be polarized in their emotional response in crowded areas. These three distinct architectural styles from St. Peter's Cathedral, Notre Dame, and La Sagrada Familia were amongst our final tests. So many of the participants showed um, conflicting emotional responses to different architectural styles. But based on the amount of data that we've collected, we could argue that yes, architectural space has a great impact on the mood of people, especially when they are confined um, or in a restricted environment. And that's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I should say, preface this, I say that there are three, pro we'll finish off with three projects, all kind of similar in a sense in trying to think about the, 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 the lockdown condition and how we might um, 
be able to kind of register um, uh, well-being, as it were, um, um, through various sort of facial recognition techniques and so on, and, and how therefore we might be able to manipulate that and improve the condition of um, of the individual during during lockdown. I just want to ask you guys. I think it's it's the project has a very interesting premise. I just would like you to maybe uh, talk a little bit about what your any observations in terms of the patterns, or you know, any conclusions or or more questions that you guys uh, figured out from that final the matrix you showed us about the three different uh, examples. You you, you used St. Peter's and uh, North Dame and Sagrada Familia, uh, and and also with regards to that, going back, I guess. To one of the important aspects of your study, which is this sort of collective reaction to not just the space, but also to the people being in a space. And I think maybe if you could speak to a little bit about Nat Chart's study about the collective space that you began with in your first slide and how that, um, I don't know if that became important to the project or not, but I think it, it's interesting to, to think about not just uh, reaction between user and space, but reaction between user and users and space and, 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 and so on. Um, so some of the results that we saw, at least in terms of um, whether or not other people were present in the space, were really uh, prevalent when it came to the, the test um, about ultra and the beach. Um, people really were either very happy to be at something that was very crowded or they hated it. It was like a very okay. polarized result um, compared to uh, a space like an open beach that doesn't have many people where they just feel generally like they're more on the same page. That's at least how the results came in. Um, so it seems like uh, when there's a lot more people present, at least, it depends on the person. That could be the variable. Um, well, well, but maybe I could just throw in there that, that, that I, you know, obviously it does depend on the person and their individual preferences and so on, but even the individual person can vary. I don't know, I used to, uh, I still have a house in Cambridge and, and um, it was kind of Cambridge, and it's like 45 minutes from London. London is really kind of buzzing, right? And Cambridge is kind of sleeping in, in some senses anyway. And it's a great place to go and do work, right? You're not distracted. You go to London, meanwhile, and then you can't even concentrate because there's so much going on. Um, uh, and, but certain times you needed to, I mean, I literally would get on the train and go for a meal in London, 45 minutes or whatever, to get the buzz, you know, it's like sticking a finger into an electric socket. And at the same time, when you're in, in London, you want to go and, and uh, um, uh, maybe escape. I mean, that's what people do at the weekend, get out of London. So it's almost like a hydraulic mechanism. You either have one or the other, but, you know, it's not constant. You can, at some points, you need the stimulation. At some points, you you don't. But uh, it is it is interesting, the fact that, you know, well, well it, it's ne inevitably the case that some people are going to respond to different stimuli. That uh, And frankly, design being, being something that... that uh, I often say that no, some, a lot of the population don't really care about, frankly. Um, but it, 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 it potentially is a mechanism which, if you if you pushed it far enough, um, uh, and assuming it's reliable enough, you eventually could get some really interesting data about what people respond to and, and when and how. So, so just to follow up on that, could I just ask um, you guys? So, if there's another lockdown, say, God forbid, but there, you know, maybe in the fall. And you 